Matters of privilege and recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all of my colleagues to the Legislature today, all of those who are tuned in on East Link Television and uh, through the various social media uh, channels. Mr. Speaker, I say welcome to everybody. Uh, I begin my remarks by saying that uh, this morning, like many in this Legislature, I had the opportunity to participate in the uh, virtual Take Your Kids to Work Day. Uh, was an absolute great event, um, joined by the Minister of Education and Early Learning for a, a precursor for today, Mr. Speaker, a question period uh, type format where the questions were difficult and pointed. I think they appreciated the answers, Mr. Speaker, much more so than maybe we see in here from time to time. But uh, it was a great event. It's something that the Public Service Commission has been doing for a while under uh, uh, Tanya Rowell, uh, Mr. Speaker, in partnership with Island Schools, uh, grade nine students. Uh, joining in my office uh, uh, was Cadence, uh, Cadence Ogden, who is the daughter of my executive assistant, Crystal, uh, Sophie Dollar, who's the daughter of my ministerial assistant, Kent, and my own son, Cal, Mr. Speaker, who normally doesn't think dad is very cool, but he got to be away from school, and more importantly, in his words, got to go to the Premier's office and lay down instead of having to go to the stalls and shovel horse manure with mom. So he thought that was a much better option for him. And, and he fit right in. He was laying down. He looked like a Premier, Mr. Speaker. He looked very comfortable in the, in the chair. But uh, congratulations to all who made that uh, uh, day possible. It was a great day. Uh, I also had the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to speak with the U.S. Council General for Atlantic Canada, Ms. Lyra Carr. Uh, she's new to the position that's based in Halifax, uh, taking over the diplomatic post from Kevin Skillen, Mr. Speaker, who I had the pleasure to work with for the last couple of years. Our introductory call was, uh, uh, was centered around the historic ties we have with this region, with the, particularly the northeastern U.S., but all of the U.S., and what an important export market it is. Uh, for us. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Buy American Clause, Mr. Speaker, and, you know, the provisions in that and how they're limiting uh, for Canadian businesses and how problematic we find that from time to time. And also we talked about the restart of tourism, Mr. Speaker, between our two countries, which is uh, so important. But it was I want to welcome uh, uh, the Consul General Carr to that post and look forward to working with her. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I was very encouraged, like many in this House, to read that City Cinema in Charlottetown is going back to full capacity. It's, uh, it really is a gem, uh, that's, uh, that location, Mr. Speaker. They're great supporters of filmmakers and creators and PEI. And I can't help but think of uh, uh, my mom and dad at the, at the Yo Theatre in Montague watching movies, Mr. Speaker. And I can't help but think that the City Cinema is somewhat what movies in the old days might have been like, and it's that nostalgia that I really enjoy the best, as well as the friendly staff who were there. So I encourage everyone across PEI to check out the schedule at City Cinema. They always have a very impressive and diverse schedule. It's a great place to, uh, uh, to, to watch a movie, so get your Vax Pass out, Mr. Speaker, and make your way to City Cinema. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. John, Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we too participated in the Take Your Kids to Work Day, and ours was uh, was not virtual. It was very real. It was very present indeed. We had two young women in our office this morning, and it was a pleasure to have them there. Uh, Amy Morse and Ava King were both with us. Amy is, while not actually a child of anybody in the office, is the child of a good friend of one of uh, the people who works in our office, Michelle Patterson. And Amy. Uh, really contributed to the conversations we had. It was great. We sat down, we had our regular caucus meeting at 10 o'clock in preparation for today, and uh, both Amy and Ava, Ava King, of course, is the daughter of the member from Charlottetown Belvedere, and I'm sure she'll make mention of that later on, but both of them contributed very openly and positively to the caucus conversation. So I hope that they enjoyed their time in the office. We certainly enjoyed having them, and uh, I, I think it's just a great initiative. And so thank you, Amy, thank you, Ava, for being part of the discussions this morning and some of the things they talked about you will actually hear here in the legislature later today. Um, some other extraordinarily extraordinary women uh, on our island, the Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. Uh, that's a volunteer not-for-profit organization that is committed to educating and providing educational opportunities for women and girls in Afghanistan. Of course, we know how disrupted that country is at the moment. And this Sunday afternoon, 
uh, the local organization of uh, Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan is holding a fundraising event at Upstreet Brewery. Um, it will feature Sadat's Cuisine, Sadat's restaurant, of course, uh, run by, or certainly unfortunately was run by um, some Afghan refugees who moved to our island many years ago. Um, they're still here and they're still doing um, catering, but they no longer have the, the restaurant on Queen Street. Um, but they are, they're definitely very much part of our community and they will be contributing to this fundraiser, as will music by the great local group, Lady Soul, who uh, you know, have a great horn section, great, you know, it's just a, a, a great band. So I'm sure that will be a wonderful afternoon. I encourage everybody to go to try and get out to Upstreet this Sunday afternoon. And the tickets are still available and donations can be made online and uh, all the proceeds from this. And it's, by the way, it's an all ages, family friendly event and they're going to support, of course, women and girls in Afghanistan. This weekend in my own district, um, the folks at Riverdale Orchard and Cidery will be celebrating Guy Fawkes Night, which is remember, remember the 5th of November when the, the legislature was burnt down. I mean, some days it feels like that may happen here. Um, but the, this is an, uh, something they've done every night. And, the, and the, uh, Alan, Anne and Alex, who, who own Riverdale Orchard, um, they're, they're from Scotland, like me. They're from the Glasgow area, actually, and, and they're great community folks, and uh, they, they have a lot of fun with their orchard. They came here for a quiet retirement, and they've set up inadvertently this incredibly successful business, <laughs> and they're loving it, uh, and they're providing a, a great service to the community, um, jobs in District 17 and beyond, and a real experience, a real tourism experience if you if you go to the Riverdale Orchard, so good for them. Uh, and that fundraiser will be on Saturday from 4.30 to 7 at their Riverdale Orchard and Cidery uh, in, in my district on Riverdale Road. And finally, looking ahead to January, and again, this is a, an example of how the world is getting back to normal, the Bonshaw Young players will actually resume their rehearsals. And they do that under the, the tutelage of Ruth Lacey, who has been doing that for so long. Com um, contributing to not just the Bonshaw community, but the island community and, and the play, the theatrical, uh, really strong theatrical community we have here on Prince Edward Island. So their rehearsals start on Saturday mornings, I, I think uh, perhaps not till January, but you have an opportunity to sign up for that now. And uh, Ruth is a great person who has changed many young kids' lives through the work that she does in theatre. So thank you, Ruth, for doing that. And I hope everybody has a great day in the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and it's great to be back today, and I'd like to say hello to everyone in District 24, Evangeline Muscush, and everyone across the province that may be watching today. Mr. Speaker, the Acadian Francophone Chamber of Commerce is seeking nominations for its annual Entrepreneur Excellent Awards. Nominations are being accepted for the Youth, on, Youth Enterprising Person Award, Social Economy Business Award, Distinguished Employee Award, Immigrant Entrepreneur Award, Business of Excellence Award, and Business Hall of Fame Award. A panel of professionals will evaluate the nominations and determine finalists and winners. The nomination deadline is November 19th, and awards will be presented at the Chamber's 20th Entrepreneurial Gala on March 12, 2022. This is always a great event that showcases the great work by members of the Acadian community, and I look forward to attending again this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a privilege to rise and to welcome everyone from District 10, Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, reading The Guardian this morning, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the sports page, front page, there was a great article on uh, Dave Henderson and Colleen Henderson, who are humongous contributors to PEI uh, tackle football here in the province and uh, their constituents. So um, I just wanted to uh, say what a great article, if you haven't had a chance to read it. Um, it's funny, a lot of uh, my friends' uh, children have started playing football this year, Mr. Speaker, and they say that one of the main reasons why their children love the sport so much is the amount of time and energy that both uh, Dave and Colleen put into it with the uh, Charlottetown Privateers. Um, and he is the general manager and uh, both the Bantam and the varsity teams are going to be competing this weekend in Summerside. So we wish all the athletes the best of luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mermaid, Stratford, and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise. Hello to everybody in Mermaid, Stratford. 
Um, so, Mr. Speaker, this morning I had the privilege of driving down Keppoch Road to have a look at the progress on the active transportation lane that is happening there from Keppoch Beach down to just past T Hill Beach, um, T Hill Park, um, and that intersection at T Hill and Ponnell Road where Keppoch and Ponnell Road meets. And um, over the last couple of months, uh, the town of Stratford has been putting in an active transportation lane there in partnership, of course, with um, uh, the other levels of government, including provincial government and the layer of uh, asphalt went down on the active transportation lane yesterday the second or the, sorry the second layer went down they're going to finish that up and now they're working on the driveways in order to give people um, the access back onto the highway so first of all I want to say thanks to everybody in that area and their patience and um, I'd also like to uh, do a shout out to the town of Stratford and the, and the province for putting in that important piece of infrastructure um, if anybody's driven on the Keppoch Road down around that area, you'll see it's used largely by cyclists um, because they access that from Stratford to get to the Ponnell Road, which is a very active place for cycling. And so I just wanted to recognize that and again say thank you to everybody for your patience over the last couple of months, and it'll be great to have that up and running and finished in the next little while. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a real pleasure to rise um, on this Wednesday morning. I welcome everybody back today, and, and uh, hello to everybody tuning in at home and District 9, Charlottetown, Hillsborough Park. Mr. Speaker, uh, as the, the Premier had mentioned there earlier, uh, we had the opportunity to participate in a virtual Take Your Kids to Work uh, Day this session this morning. and, and Afterwards, I found out there was over th a thousand students tuned in. So uh, that's pretty remarkable. It was uh, it was a really engaging um, session, and it really provided me an opportunity to reflect on on my uh, grade nine experience. And I remember in grade nine, I followed Dr. Moray um, in his clinic all day, and it really was eye opening for me uh, to follow a family doctor throughout the day. And it really uh, it really st uh, stuck with me. And and I've uh, I've often um, thought back to that time and that day. So anyway, I wanted to thank all the uh, organizers, all the parents, all the students who are participating today, Mr. Speaker. Um, also, Mr. Speaker, kindergarten registration for the 2022-2023 school year is now open. Parents are asked to register their children for kindergarten prior to or during the week of November 15th to 19th. Um, details and forms are available through the PSB, CSLF, or our local school. Uh, last year, Mr. Speaker, I remember this time of year, I was, I was signing my, uh, my oldest child up for, for kindergarten. So it's really exciting. It's uh, it's certainly a, a, a pivotal time for, for parents and for families and for kids. So anyway, I wish uh, wish everyone well. And, and again, I, I hope uh, we have a wonderful day today. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as you've heard, um, my daughter was one of the, the kids that came to actually to the, the uh, legislature today. Um, and I wanted to extend my thanks to um, to you, Speaker, and to the Sergeant at Arms, um, as well to the member from Tignish Palmer Road, who all helped make her experience a memorable one. She was particularly struck when she came into the um, uh, the space here to see the picture of women on the wall. Um, it was she made a beeline for it, and, and I think that you know that really kind of speaks to how impactful it is to have that picture there, that, that a 14-year-old, that's what she saw when she came in this space. She thought your robes were particularly dashing, Mr. Speaker, and she was very impressed with your commute, <laughs> member from Tignish Palmer Road. But, but what it does, it does to have this experience um, is, is to give people, uh, to give um, a teenagers a chance to have a, a, a view into sort of what life looks like outside of the, the school experience. So I really did want to extend my thanks to those who've made her day that much more memorable. And, um, and I look forward to seeing who joins us next time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I miss anyone? Member statement. The honorable member from, the honorable leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to take the opportunity to say a few words in advance of Remembrance Day. It's been more than 100 years since the First World War ended, and the memory of so many young men and women has faded. But we do our best to spend some time every year reflecting on the sacrifices of a few on behalf of so many. Each of these young men and women were universed into themselves, and their sudden and violent departures from this world are a source of great sadness. 
Across the street from here, there is a plaque in St. Paul's Anglican Church. It marks the brief life and sudden death of Frederick John Longworth, who was born in Charlottetown and is buried in Belgium. Lieutenant Longworth served with the 36th Howitzer Battery. He was wounded at Hill 70 in 1917, a battle that resulted in more than 9,000 Canadian casualties. He won the Military Cross for distinguished and commendable service at the Second Battle of Amiens in August of 1918, as the war was heading into its final months. Afterwards, Lieutenant Long Worth marked his 25th birthday on September 21st, 1918, and he did it a long way from home, only 25 years old and a long way from home. It's hard to imagine how difficult it must have been for such a young man to experience so much in such a short time, and I am sure he watched with some anticipation as the war drew to a grinding close. But Lieutenant Longworth was killed in action, sadly, on November 10, 1918, one day before the guns went silent. Now the death of every young person in an ugly war is a tragedy. And in the case of the First World War, the awful decisions of powerful men resulted in a vast, pointless slaughter. We must remember them all, but we also need to grasp the reality that each of these unique, irreplaceable young individuals gave up everything they had under terrible conditions. And it frankly breaks my heart to think of a young man or any young person dying one day before the war would end. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Tignish Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, another fall sitting has come around, and we've seen no action taken on a long-term solution to the choke point between uh, Portage and West Devon on Route 2. Now, Mr. Speaker, I previously posed this question, uh, this issue as a question to the Minister of Justice and Public Safety and the Minister of Transportation in the past. But after three years, the choke point remains. So I figured I would change things up this year with a statement. The choke point represents the only land route connecting West Prince to the rest of the island. And if that route were to become obstructed, Western PI would be cut off and isolated. I've had many discussions with my own constituents, and uh, in particular West Prince residents, over the years regarding this vulnerability in our highway infrastructure. Many folks in West Prince travel through this area to attend necessary medical appointments. Uh, many businesses travel through this area on a day-to-day -day basis for their operations. And many families live on either side of that choke point. That particular area is located in a marshland that has waterways on either side that connect the Northumberland Strait and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We know the recently released climate risk assessment notes erosion, tropical storms, and flooding as potential climate risks facing Prince Edward Island. And each of those events could impact this important piece of highway infrastructure. We've heard temporary solutions like Bailey Bridges and utilizing the nearby Confederation Trail. And while those may provide relief in an emergency, they are not a long-term solution. I continue to hear from residents on a consistent basis asking if there are any plans to fully address the West Prince choke point. And I've not been able to give them a satisfactory answer yet. It is my hope but I won't have to raise this issue in the House again next fall. That would mark my fifth year in a row, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley and the Opposition Whip. The report from the Premier's Council for Recovery and Growth was a long time coming. But it's not so much what's in the report that is of concern, but what isn't. From its very inception, the stated purpose of this council, as, state, as set out by the Premier, failed to acknowledge the health and well-being of workers as a primary goal. With the core membership chosen by the Premier overwhelmingly dominated by business leaders, the experiences of workers remain in the shadows. There is a focus in the report on which industries have been hardest hit by COVID, but there is very little on which groups of workers have been hardest hit, women, young and racialized workers. It is implied that workers need more, quote, ambition, rather than the need to provide meaningful opportunities to learn and grow. There is no mention of the need to ensure our workplaces are fair and safe, and that all workers are able to earn a decent living for themselves and their families. 
Growth of our working age population numbers is critical. Immigration will be central to meeting our labour market needs as well as keeping our young island workers here on PEI. However, we can't talk about population growth without also talking about housing. We can't talk about population growth without also ensuring all new and established islanders can earn a living that will allow them to meet their basic needs in thriving communities. Key issues highlighted in both the public and MLA consultations for workers, such as health care, housing, and a true basic income guarantee receive only a passing mention at best in the recommendations. Focusing solely on the needs of business rather than on the well-being of workers not only fails islanders, but is also a lost opportunity to set PEI apart to recruit and retain skilled workers that will finally begin to address our labour shortages. Simply put, if government is not serious about improving working and living conditions for islanders, it cannot be serious about the future of our economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of yes. member statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as noticed. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Um, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. So yesterday, the member from Charlottetown Belvedere asked why the department does not provide financial assistance to clients to help with moving costs and rental deposits. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to clarify that the department, through the Social Programs Division, does provide support to our clients for moving related expenses, including rental deposits, moving costs, and utility hookup expenses. And the level of support is, that is offered is based on need and the level of eligibility of each client. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No one else? For a first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. A few weeks ago, after delaying nearly a year because he wasn't satisfied with it, the Premier finally released the plan from his Economic Recovery Council. While this government is normally quite keen to make announcements, sometimes prematurely, sometimes repeatedly, and often with little or no substance, government has been eerily quiet about this economic plan. To me, that does not signal much confidence in the trajectory of our province. A question to the Premier. Why don't you want to talk about your economic plan? Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, for the 77th time, it's not an economic plan. It's a recovery and growth plan, Mr. Speaker, which deals with the uh, environment, which deals with the economy, all aspects of our, uh, of our future, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we released uh, what the findings were, uh, the recommendations were. We haven't released our plan yet, Mr. Speaker, because COVID isn't over. So we're working through it. We've implemented over 50% of the recommendations from the island-wide panel, Mr. Speaker, and it's ironic to hear the line of questioning and the statement from the honorable member prior to this. The business community tells me there was too much social influence in the report, Mr. Speaker, and now I'm hearing there's not enough uh, social. So I think somewhere in the middle, Mr. Speaker, maybe we hit the right notes, but it is just that. It's a blueprint to try to make this province better, uh, to take the uh, difficulties we've learned through COVID and the innovations that we've learned and put it into uh, into, into action, Mr. Speaker, uh, and that involves all aspects of PEI life, Mr. Speaker, not just uh, the economy. John believe the official opposition. Well, I find that interesting because if we're going to wait for COVID to be over, we may never ever see this plan, economic plan or whatever, because COVID may become endemic. I think it's time for this government, having spun up three councils, to actually come forward with an economic plan for the future of this province. Islanders are struggling with cumulative and overwhelming increases to the cost of living. In some cases, <laughs> in some cases these, these increases are forcing people out of the workforce, and in other cases, it's actually forcing them out of our province. Labour shortages are one of the biggest barriers to achieving our social and economic potential, yet this government seems to be doing little to guarantee the best possible working and social conditions. Unlike the Minister of Transportation, who thinks that the greatest asset of our province is our roads, our caucus actually believes that our greatest asset is our people. To the Premier, 
to the Premier. How does this government intend to make Prince Edward Island the most competitive and attractive Canadian destination for skilled workers? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot packed into that, and uh, I would just say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we've learned a lot about ourselves through this time of COVID, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and while COVID will always be around us, the pandemic will end at some point, Mr. Speaker. We've implemented over 50% of the recommendations that have been put in place, Mr. Speaker. And I find it ironic that the uh, uh, the picture painted by the leader of the opposition would be so bleak. I meet with Senator uh, Pate, Mr. Speaker, who's one of the leading voices in, uh, in, in improving the social network, Mr. Speaker. And she writes to me in a letter and says, I wish every jurisdiction could could be like PEI. Keep up the great leadership, Prince Edward Island. You're the one. Uh, the leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Well, this is what leadership looks like, apparently. Higher wages. Uh, those are not just better for workers' well-being. They can also help our economy. And, and that's not just me in our caucus that's saying that. The most recent Nobel laureate, David Card, who happens to be a Canadian, has proven that higher minimum wage does not lead to fewer jobs, and in fact it can be a real economic booster. Apparently Doug Ford has been listening to this because his government just increased their minimum wage to $15, uh, which will take effect on January 1st, in part to make his, his province more competitive and attractive for skilled workers, but also to get people back into the workforce. And of course, like us, $15 is going to take them nowhere near what a living wage actually is to the Premier. Do you think that aggressive minimum wage increases are an effective approach to getting more people back into the workforce? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've been on record since the very beginning to say that for too long we have built this island as a place to do things cheaply, Mr. Speaker, and I think we've paid a price for that over the years. I think we need to pay people more money, Mr. Speaker, and we're working toward that. The minimum wage in Prince Edward Island will increase by 70 cents this year, Mr. Speaker. That's an incredible uh, number, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but you know what? That is just that. It's a minimum wage. We need to make sure that this province is the most competitive that it can be, Mr. Speaker, and part of that competitive advantage is utilizing that great asset of our people and making sure they're compensated fairly, Mr. Speaker. Now, the leader of the official opposition. Uh, thanks, Speaker. So one of the remarkable things about the, the economic plan is that it's intended to facil facilitate an economic and a social and an environmental recovery. The Premier's already said that. But it makes no reference to housing whatsoever. And the word, uh, the word rural doesn't appear either, by the way, but no reference to housing. We are seeing rapidly rising housing costs here on Prince Edward Island, whether you own a house or whether you're renting a house, and that is not accompanied by better wages. So it's very hard to support your local economy, as we all are encouraging islands, islanders to do, if you're paying 30 or 40 or 50 percent of your income on housing. In fact, Food Banks Canada's Hunger Count report showed that more than half of the people accessing food banks on Prince Edward Island were tenants in market rental units. To the Premier, do you believe it's a strong economy when more and more islanders are struggling to afford the basics and a roof over their head? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think the economy of Prince Edward Island has performed remarkably considering what we've been through the last 20 months. But that doesn't mean that we live in a perfect society, Mr. Speaker. And that doesn't mean that there aren't people that uh, require our assistance, Mr. Speaker. And that's what we're trying to continue to work at at a breakneck speed, Mr. Speaker. I've been on record with the housing issue from the very beginning. We're playing significant catch up here. We're trying to be as aggressive as we can be. And we're trying to look for new solutions, Mr. Speaker, to make sure people have a place to lay down their head that they can call their own, Mr. Speaker. And I am enlightened that the Honourable Member referred, Mr. Speaker, to the importance of rural Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker, because I've heard throughout this legislature that it was referred to by his party as the hinterland, Mr. Speaker, and I think that's offensive to all rural islanders, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Earlier about what leadership in this province looks like economically. This is what it looks like. Wages are too low. The cost of living is rising. Housing is unattainable. Islanders are unable to get the health care they need. Health care workers themselves are burnt out and stretched thin by this government. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. At the same time, um, this government is telling islanders every day that the economy is working for them. Well, if it's not working for them, if I thought this was all about people. If the economy is not working for islanders, then who is the economy working for? 
Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I will say again that the economy of Prince Edward Island has performed remarkably well through a very difficult time, the most difficult time in the last hundred years, Mr. Speaker. But that doesn't mean that it's perfect. That doesn't mean that everyone has been beneficial, Mr. Speaker. There have been impacts, as there always is, uh, Mr. Speaker, particularly when you have, uh, you know, uh, impediments like we've seen through COVID, Mr. Speaker. Our government continues to try hard to address all of these issues, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to call Prince Edward Island home. I think it's one of the most amazing places in the world, Mr. Speaker. And as I said before in here, I, I, you know, I, I know that the opposition paints this picture and, and, and uh, this horrible picture, but uh, most people I know are proud to call Prince Edward Island home, Mr. Speaker. And I think we have to start talking in that regard. That doesn't mean we're, it's perfect. That doesn't mean we don't uh, need to be uh, make significant improvements, Mr. Speaker, which we're all in this House committed to. But I think we have to take a long look, Mr. Speaker, particularly in the last 20 months, and say Prince Edward Island is a pretty special place, and I think we're forgetting that sometimes here, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. It's actually really um, easy to forget that this is a great place when you talk to people every single day who don't have somewhere safe to live. <laughs> However, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm going to talk about small business for a change. Each 1% reduction in small business tax reduces the corporate income tax revenue for the province by $2.8 million. <laughs> That's more than half of the annual budget of the Employment Development Agency that actually creates jobs and training programs, Mr. Speaker. It's more than half of the annual budget of the Public Health Office. It's about the same as the annual budget for Access PEI. Question for the Minister of Finance. Why do you think reducing government revenues by $2.8 million annually is a better solution to help small businesses than investing in direct programs that offer real supports, wage subsidy, of subsidies, upskilling programs, training incentives, even childcare? Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Speaker. And honourable Member, uh, this was one of the th the, the main uh, issues that was brought forward to us by the Chambers of Commerce. Uh, they wanted to have that advantage in Atlantic Canada. We're willing to work with all small businesses, and this gives them an opportunity. As we know, small business, when, they, when they're successful, they reinvest in their own business and their own employees, and that's what we want to see happen in Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is one of the main platform commitments of this government. And reducing the small business tax rate by 1%, reducing the small business tax rate by 1% provides a maximum tax benefit of $5,000, maximum. In reality, the 1% reduction in the small business tax rate provides a tax break of about $500 to the average PEI small business. $500, Mr. Speaker. Question for the Minister of Finance. Do you really expect $500 to be of any real help to a struggling island business? Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, we have been there for island business throughout COVID. We will continue to be there for them. And I would, sh I would say if you ask any uh, small business in Prince Edward Island, $500 does make a difference to them, uh, Mr. Speaker. And that money will go back into the economy of Prince Edward Island, go back into their business. And this is something that was asked for us, to us uh, by small businesses across the island. It was part of our platform commitment, and we are very proud that we were able to meet that commitment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Belvedere. And it was part of your platform commitment. The main pressure facing small businesses in the province... <laughs> The main pressure facing small businesses in this province is the inability to find workers. Question for the Minister of Finance. Can you explain how $500 helps a small business solve their labour shortage challenges? Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And honourable member, if you look across this country, you'll find there's labour shortages. We are all working for and, com and competing for those uh, employees. We will do whatever we can to help small business. Throughout COVID, uh, if you look at... Uh, and, and I'm very surprised there were no questions about the public accounts that came out on Friday. We have done very well. We have a deficit of $5.6 million. But on top of that, we provided four, over 40 programs for Islanders during COVID, honourable member. And we will continue to be there for small business. And throughout COVID, small businesses on Prince Edward Island did very well. And it was because of the actions of all Islanders. And we're very proud to stand and say that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. In Canada, we understand that a health care system you can't afford to access is all but meaningless. Money shouldn't be the deciding factor on your health and outcomes. In the same vein, I worry about the huge impact a lack of money is having on access to justice. 
question to the Minister of Justice. How important is money to a person's ability to get a fair shake at justice? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Public Safety. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And access to justice is one of the most important uh, things uh, we, can, we can do for victims, Mr. Speaker. And uh, when we, uh, luckily here on the island, we don't have an issue with the access to justice as they are having right now in other provinces, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have to give some credit to the courts for their, their uh, ability to continue to work through COVID uh, so we don't have the backup and access to justice. But money is important. Uh, it, it, it's important that the victims get the services, Mr. Speaker, and that they get it in a timely manner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Access to justice isn't just about victims and it isn't just about court delays. We hear from constituents all the time who need legal representation, but the cost is so prohibitive that they end up trying to represent themselves, and this means worse outcomes for them. A person working full time would have to earn less than $9 an hour to be eligible for legal aid. Legal aid is being grossly underfunded. Question to the Question to the Minister of Justice. We asked government to increase legal aid funding substantially, but a mere half of our ask was granted. Do you feel that's enough? Honorable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we have increased the legal aid to new lawyers, Mr. Speaker. The thresh there are thresholds, Mr. Speaker. Are they enough? No, Mr. Speaker, we have to keep moving that. Uh, we've, we're in negotiations with the federal government, Mr. Speaker, for more support from the federal government. They have to be a playing partner with us here, Mr. Speaker, so access to justice for all is equal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, but it's not equal right now. A mother of one working full time would still have to be making less than minimum wage to qualify for help. So if she has to figure out her messy divorce alone, and if she does get so few hours at work that she does qualify, then division of assets isn't something that legal aid is allowed to help her with, despite the obvious impact this is going to have on her and her child, considering how little they make. Question to the Minister of Justice. Why does government leave so much outside the scope of what legal aid can help with? Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are resources, Mr. Speaker, at the Family Law Center that uh, we can help provide it for mediation on these cases, Mr. Speaker. But can we do more? Yes, we have to do more. We, can, we have to continue to uh, help families help single moms like the examples that she gave, that we, uh, their access to jef justice is fair and adequate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Their access currently is not fair, and while there are programs they will not help with division of assets and other things they won't help with include tenancy issues. Tenancy disputes are increasingly complicated and difficult to navigate, and we hear this all the time in our office. These issues could result in a person being homeless in a housing crisis, but you can't get legal aid help for that either. Question to the Minister of Justice. What should I tell people when they need help with their tenancy disputes and can't afford a lawyer? The Honorable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, some of the, for the answer to that question, Mr. Speaker, and it's not, a pop, it's not going to be a popular answer, it's the IRAC. They have to go to IRAC for the assistance. It's the third independent body regulator that will help a tenant in, in these cases, Mr. Speaker. Um, we have to do more, and I'll continue. I'll, I'll be, look forward to talking to the member. Uh, on this, Mr. Speaker, if there's more opportunities that we can for the uh, victims uh, to get access to justice, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Robot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's not a popular answer because it's not correct. IRAC does not. IRAC does not help in tenancy disputes. They don't fill out paperwork. They don't prep documents. They don't attend hearings. They don't help plan appeals. People need representation from a lawyer. I don't understand how government doesn't get this. With the salaries of people in this room, you would struggle to pay for legal representation. I don't know how we expect people on minimum wage to do it. Question to the minister. This is not in legislation. It's in policy. So you have the ability to just change it. Will you increase the scope of legal aid to reflect the things that islanders actually need legal, resport, legal support for? Or are you going to continue to leave islanders behind? The Honorable Minister of Justice and Public Safety. We'll take a look at this, Mr. Speaker, see if we can change the thresholds, Mr. Speaker, and we'll do it uh, with 
uh, discussions with the federal government as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Strafford. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, the Auditor General of New Brunswick found that the province's contract with Medivy Health Services, a private company, was poorly structured, allowing for questionable payments for paramedic vacancies. Similar to PEI, Medivy was not able to staff all of their ambulances in New Brunswick, but the province continued to pay the full amount, resulting in an $8 million surplus of taxpayer dollars to the private company. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Are you paying Medivy Health Services for ambulances even when they are not, um, even when they are not staffed and on the roads? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, Mr. Speaker, uh, I would uh, clarify that it is a not-for-profit company, Medivy. And I want the EMS. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, yesterday it was brought forward and it was insinuated that as of today that there would be six buses, six ambulances, not on the road because of staffing challenges. Mr. Speaker, I will confirm here today that every ambulance that was scheduled to be on the road today is on the road fully staffed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm so glad to hear that. And I certainly hope that that is a trend that continues. And by the way, when it, Medivy Health Services is a private a company, the Auditor General of New Brunswick called it a private, a private company. I take her version of that than yours. Question to the Minister. Will you table all service contracts between the province of PEI and, and Medivy Health Services? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would be happy to uh, table all contracts, Mr. Speaker. But with that, I will certainly have to get uh, uh, opinion as to what may, if anything, have to be redacted, taken out. But, Mr. Speaker, I would be happy to table those as soon as possible. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Speaker, uh, Chief Darlene Bernard said in committee she was disappointed in the delay in the execution of the Treaty Rights Education Initiative. She expected some movement by this winter, and uh, the treaties of peace and friendship are pivotal, pivotal to our understanding of our past, where we came from, and what responsibilities we have to each other as treaty people. A question to the Minister. Why was this delayed, and when will we see treaty rights integrated into our education system? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm wondering, is he referring to the Minister responsible for Indigenous Affairs? Is that who you were addressing the question to? Or, uh, yeah, so Mr. Speaker, we're, we're working as part of our uh, table, Mr. Speaker, to get all of these uh, uh, important uh, initiatives underway, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, you know we have a good relationship with our First Nations here. It's one that's not uh, built on confrontation, Mr. Speaker, but but collaboration. Uh, I think that the Chief indicated in that meeting that she has great faith that this will get done, Mr. Speaker, and I have committed that we get it done as soon as possible, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's some T's dot crossing and I's dotted that are, need to be done, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker and uh, I look forward to, the, uh, to executing that as quickly as possible, Mr. Speaker, because it's important for our First Nations and it's important for Prince Edward Island. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's well known that morale issues at Health PEI are driving people away from the workplace. And most of it boils down to severe understaffing. It's a vicious cycle and more people are leaving. It's harder to get on, it's harder to get on those who, it's harder on those who are remaining and eventually they also leave. Earlier this year, the head of the nurses union told a standing committee about one nurse. She said this was a stellar nurse coming on out onto the floor and just couldn't get educational leaves and was feeling devalued and chose to leave the profession. What is the minister doing to address these serious and growing retention problems among health care workers? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank uh, the Honourable Leader of the Third Party for the question. Uh, you know, uh, the things that he brings forward is obviously a concern to him. 
Mr. Speaker, it's a concern to me as well when I hear them. Uh, but I will have to say, Mr. Speaker, that Health PEI has taken certain initiatives to look at this. You look at uh, the exit uh, studies that have been carried out, Mr. Speaker, and then the recommendations that did come forward from those ex er, exit studies, um, surveys, I should say, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and the action that Health PEI is taking on them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is a problem here. You can't expect, you can't retain health care professionals because the workplace is simply not meeting the needs of people. And it's not always about money. It's about quality of life. And we have heard that time and time again from frontline health care staff. Mm -hmm. Until we get to the bottom of this, the vacancies causing health care disruptions will only worsen. Question to the Minister of Health. How do you plan on recruiting new health care professionals to PEI when you cannot retain the ones currently here? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, I agree 100 per cent with uh, the Honourable Leader of the Third Party. But it is not always about money. The quality of life is so important to all of our health care providers, whether it's doctors, whether it's nurses, RCWs and the like. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, one of the things uh, tomorrow I am meeting with the complete executive leadership team at Health PEI, and that will certainly be one of the things that will be discussed at that point in time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, here about uh, a little over a week ago, uh, the Premier and I had the privilege to meet with the executive director and the president of the PEI Nurses Union, and that was one of the aspects, one of the topics that we looked at as well, Mr. Speaker. So it certainly it is very much on our government's radar, on my radar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Do I believe the third party or second supplementary? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. According to the head of the PEI Nurses Union, 25% of the nursing staff are looking to exit the profession. That's a horrifying number, particularly on top of the 700 plus vacancies we already have in health care. We already, we're already experiencing disruptions to health care services, and that would get considerably worse if 25 percent of nurses left the profession. Question to the Minister of Health. What succession plans have been put in place to deal with this potential exodus? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the Honourable Leader of the Third Party for the question. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, it certainly it is a, a recruitment challenge. It's also a retention challenge, which uh, the Honourable Member has alluded to. But, Mr. Speaker, some of the initiatives that we have taken, in addition to working with, listening to our partners uh, that deliver health care services, you look at uh, the incentive that is offered, Mr. Speaker, to graduate nurses, $5,000 for a return for service. Mr. Speaker, since we increased that as a government back from 1100 to 5000 Mr. Speaker, that has resulted in 200 grads being hired here, Mr. Speaker, 200 new nurse graduates on the province. And we have to do more. We're in competition right across the whole country for health care workers. We have to be competitive, Mr. Speaker, and we will be, and recognize the great service that is provided by these professionals. Thank you. Honourable Member from O'Leary in Furness. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. During this legislative sitting, we have observed a lot of, about this government's approach to health care issues. They seem to run into a problem, then the many old magical distraction techniques of an experienced musician come into play, Mr. Speaker. The problem is the sleight of hand is what uh, means that these problems don't disappear in some puff of storytelling smoke. After questions of 42 empty long-term beds on PEI, the minister announced that 21 long-term care beds will be open to deal with the backlog of medical needs in their health system. From which magical hat did the Minister of Health find these new staff to deal with opening these 21 beds? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I recall last year that uh, the Honourable Member at one point thought that health care was a game. Another time he thought it was a joke. Now he thinks it's magical. Mr. Speaker, it's none of the above. What it comes down to is the hard work that is in day out, day out, day in, day out, 
by our health care, whether it's with regard to retention, whether it's with regard to recruitment, and specifically, Mr. Speaker, with regard to the great work that our frontline staff do, and again, day in, day out. Thank you. O'Leary Inverness. The minister is indeed correct. It is the staff in these nursing homes that spend a lot of time with each patient. If there are more beds and not the appropriate staffing numbers, it means that there will be fewer hours dedicated directly to each islander in a long-term care bed. What is the minister doing to address possible shortfalls in service delivery? And I'm thinking, he's no Houdini, so he must have found these people somewhere. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, short answer to that question, no, I am no Houdini. I do not uh, find these individuals. The ones that find them are the hard-working staff that work day in, day out at Health PEI and Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Larry M. second supplementary. And it seems to me he hasn't found them. It's not magic that will fix these problems, Mr. Speaker. It's not some sort of wave a magic wand and, and uh, things automatically appear. It is hard work of the staff that care for these residents. Can the minister guarantee that his latest smoke and mirrors trick will not result in less hands-on service delivery for the islanders who need care in their long-term care facilities? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, the, the honourable member, I know that he has a great passion for health care. He's a former minister. Uh, I don't know, though, did he have a magic wand back there a few years ago? Uh, I don't think so from what, what I've seen, from what I have been told, Mr. Speaker. But just we have to look forward. We have to look forward to the programs that are needed, Mr. Speaker. It's looking forward and working with our partners at UPEI, our partners at Holland College. It's working and seeing what is not only needed now, Mr. Speaker, but what is needed over the next two years, four years, five, ten years. And it's unfortunate that that vision wasn't provided. We are taking it, we are moving forward, and we will be there, continue to be there for Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, West Friday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the spring setting session of the government, uh, the government pledged to create 300 new childcare spaces for this fall. However, before the sitting ended, that number was reduced to 241. An expansion of childcare spaces is, is a positive step, and I credit the government for making progress. However, numbers do matter, particularly for those without access to childcare. Initially, government plan, plan was 300 new spaces by the fall of 2021, but we're now getting some 200 spaces for the fall of 22. Question to the Minister of Education, exactly how many new child care spaces were open this fall and when you table a breakdown of where all new spaces are located? Diable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, really pleased to get a question around early learning in child care, Mr. Speaker, and a topic I'm extremely passionate about, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for, for bringing this question forward. With regards to the, the specifics around spaces, I can certainly bring that back to the House, Mr. Speaker, but uh, I do want to um, go back to this summer whereby we signed a, uh, an agreement with the federal government, um, one that uh, is historic in nature, uh, $121 million, Mr. Speaker, over five years with a two-year action plan, Mr. Speaker. And the commitment that my staff has shown throughout the last number of months is um, really <coughs> incredible and impeccable, and I'm so proud of the work that we're doing on this. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to increase spaces um, by designating more centers, um, by encouraging uh, more uh, home centers to become licensed, Mr. Speaker. We've got lots of different programs in place and, and strategies in place to uh, educate more staff and retain more staff, Mr. Speaker. There is so much uh, in this action plan, Mr. Speaker, and I could probably go on and on about it all day, no. Mr. Speaker, but I'm going to sit down now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Charlottetown, West Royal. Thank you for the answer. Um, since, this, since discussion began about a large expansion of childcare spaces, we've asked the question, where will you get the staff? We've asked last session to receive no answers. We followed up with the minister in, in a September letter, and at the time, there were, they were only collecting such data. I find it concerning that half a year later, government still cannot articulate how many new ECEs were hired to support the additional spaces that were first introduced this fall. Question to the Minister of Education. Can you finally tell us how many new ECEs were hired since the end of June 2021 to support the new spaces that were first introduced this fall? 
Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, that's a number I'll have to get back from my staff, and I can certainly bring it to the House, Mr. Speaker. But we recognize the value that our early childhood educators bring, Mr. Speaker. I wouldn't be able to be here today without them, Mr. Speaker. And, and that is why we are um, we have some retention grants in place, and Mr. Speaker, and lots of professional development opportunities for those that are currently educators in the system, Mr. Speaker. But that being said, we recognize we need more um, uh, to support the increased growth in spaces, Mr. Speaker. So um, come February, there'll be a new accelerated program and certification through Holland College, Mr. Speaker. And we're working on, on something with Ilde College as well, Mr. Speaker. And in January, we're going through a partnership with Skills PEI and the ECDA, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are uh, going to continue along our Steps to Success program, Mr. Speaker, whereby there'll be 100 participants um, encouraged to, to get involved over the next two years, Mr. Speaker. And again, I could go on about this all day. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to sit down right now. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Show now, West Toronto, your second supplementary. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks for the answer. But one of the biggest issues uh, facing the last federal election was childcare access, specifically $10 a day. PEI signed on, and it was sold by the Premier Minister as a way to expand childcare access. access while freeing up parents for job opportunities. Despite support for the plan, over half the Conservative Cabinet campaigned alongside candidates committed to scrapping the $10 a day plan. Question to the Minister of Education. Seeing that your government quickly signed on to a $10 a day plan, why did over half the Cabinet campaign against it? The Honourable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I certainly can't speak on behalf of the rest of my colleagues, but Mr. Yeah, Speaker, I, throughout the federal campaign, I actually supported all, all the candidates in some way, shape, or form, whether you're Liberal, you're Green, you're NDP, you're Conservative, Mr. Speaker. I was there. I was available to have those conversations with them, Mr. Speaker. But certainly, I recognized um, the importance of this agreement, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I can't. I can't rewrite history, but the, the Liberals did. Um, they did uh, win in the in the federal election, Mr. Speaker, and I am really pleased to see this uh, agreement uh, continue forward, Mr. Speaker, because I know how important it is as a mother of two young children. I know how important it is for families across Prince Edward Island, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. This is historical in nature, Mr. Speaker, and I am so proud of the partnership that we have with the federal government, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Same <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as we work to reduce our reliance on, on fossil fuels here in PEI and uh, get to, uh, uh, we hope that electrification gives us a chance to get to zero carbon here in PEI. However, that goal of increased electricity use in things like our heating. Uh, and electric vehicles here in the province is going to have a significant impact on our grid, Mr. Speaker. A question to the Minister of Environment, uh, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, is our grid ready for the shift that we are taking as a province? The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Action. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So through the study that we commissioned, we, we found that in order to, to meet our goals, we're going to roughly double the size of our our draw of, of electricity onto the grid. So the tactical component of it, I can't say for sure, but I'm, my answer would be I'm doubtful that the grid as it stands today could handle twice the amount of electricity across it. And, uh, you know, and as you also know, we have the undersea cable. We'd have to look and see if that, or we could look on island, which is what we're trying to do and work with partners to make that happen uh, in an accelerated fashion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, doubling our, uh, our use is, uh, is a, a serious uh, number. Um, uh, the, the, the minister's right. We have to look off island for that. And, and I don't know if our cable is, is ready for doubling uh, right now uh, or just dis distributed generation, as the minister uh, speaks about, I think has to be part of the solution, um, not being reliant on that uh, at a province uh, generation. What are we did then doing as a, as a province to help facilitate that increased uh, distributed generation? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess at its lowest level, uh, residential solar is distributed energy. We're getting more of that all the time, and we need to kind of continue to grow in, in that fashion. <clears throat> we, we've talked about community generation through our, our Sustainable Communities project. We have a couple of communities that are uh, very close to getting their project fully off of the, <clears throat> the ground, and we have uh, a, a couple others that are kind of in that discussion stage. So we have to continue to work with communities. We have to continue to work with residential uh, people in your own home 
to get them to, to switch over to solar. <clears throat> and we have to, of course, work with the utility to make sure that they're ready to build that plan around how we can build a, a, a distributed model that works for both us and for them. Thank you. Well, Donna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, I don't pretend this is easy. I can understand from working with with uh, with our provider, of course, when they increase our increase their capital expenditure, it, it therefore increases our rates as, as Islanders as well. Um, the the member for Charlton mm -hmm. Belvedere had talked about adaptation the other day, and she had talked about with the uh, First Nations and, and municipalities. I want to ask you about uh, ad, uh, the impact of climate change on our grid as well. What are we doing as a province for adaptation <coughs> when climate change is going to impact our grid? John Board Minister of Environment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I know that maritime electrons themselves are doing a, a climate uh, um, resiliency test or, or, or plan for their, for their own grid and for their own assets. And uh, for internally, we're looking at, at looking at that from our, our own perspective. But um, we do know that, th that there will be increased wind, increased heat. Those things may impact the, the grid and our ability to keep the, uh, the power on, particularly if there's higher points of people needing things like air conditioning may tip the grid off. Um, overall, we have to be worried about the resiliency of our grid moving forward uh, in order to, to assure that Communities like Surrey has their power all the time, and places like I've talked about the launching loop in my, my district that you know would be the end of the line otherwise. We have to make sure that there's resiliency built into it so that they can continue to have their, their power. So we're, we're trying to build a resiliency plan internally. Um, we're, we'll, of course, take it internally to government, take it here, and we're gonna, we'll take it to uh, um, Maritime Electric and say, here's kind of how we view the, the future, and here's how we view um, it, it kind of operating, and hopefully Maritime Electric will see the, the value in in taking that on. That uh, it creates long-term term sustainability for the province, and that it creates resiliency that we need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Bright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It has been great to see the new electric school buses on Island Roads, and I look forward to seeing more and more of them in the future. Back in May, the Minister of Justice and Public Safety told the House that training for first responders on how to deal with electric vehicles was a priority. High voltage line and combustible batteries of EV cars and buses pose completely new challenges. Question to the Minister. Can you provide an update on what training has been offered to first responders since that time? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Training has happened at the uh, with the fire school uh, t for uh, volunteers across this island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, right. Thank you, Mick. Uh, thank you, Mr. S uh, Speaker. And uh, it's funny, I've heard the opposite, that no training has taken place. And I'm not implying that the EVs are unsafe. They're just they're safer, but they're different. A simple safety measure that is often used on electric or other alternate fuel Buses is to put a different color bumper on them so they're more easily recognizable for the first responders. Apparently none of our new electric buses came with this feature. Question to the minister. When will all of the province's electric buses be outfitted with this or some other safety feature like that? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, installation is actually uh, already in the process of happening. We've uh, been dealing with our, our supplier, uh, Lion, uh, with regards to ensuring that the proper code, the proper stickers, the proper color, et cetera, et cetera, conforms with all national regulations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Last spring, this House debated the Election Age Act to lower the voting age to 16. While the events of the last two weeks have shown us that island teens are perfectly capable of clearly and coherently expressing themselves, they still do not have the right to express their views in an election. One of the arguments we heard against lowering the voting age is that island youth first need to access, improve, to, access to improved civics education. Question to the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. What steps are you taking to enhance and expand civics education in island schools? The Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. And certainly there was um, some great debate 
um, regarding the Election Age Act last session, and, and certainly we recognize the importance of civic ed education in our school, our school curriculum, Mr. Speaker. I know our staff is continuously um, improving our curriculum, Mr. Speaker. As per um, what updates have been made since the last session, I can certainly get that back to the House. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by Ministers. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm delighted to rise today to announce a new position in the Department of Social Development and Housing that will support island seniors. This is the PEI Seniors Navigator. Uh, the Seniors Navigator will assist seniors as they navigate the program supports and services provided by municipal, provincial and federal governments and nonprofit and private service organizations. Uh, Mr. Speaker, part of the role of the Seniors Navigator will be to identify barriers and complex information and then recommend ways to make it easier for seniors to find the programs and services that they need. The Seniors Navigator will work one-on-one -on -one with a senior caregiver or family to ensure they can access the appropriate services available to them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last week in the House, I spoke about the importance of age-friendly communities. Bringing on a Seniors Navigator to help to cultivate stronger connections in communities uh, across the province. That's another role that they'll serve. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I wanted to give a lot of credit for the Seniors Navigator to the, to the leader of the th third party, who I know is a strong advocate for seniors. Um, yes, Mr. Speaker, uh, he's worked tirelessly, and, and he had a bill that he was going to bring to the floor about for a seniors advocate. We worked together collaboratively, and uh, together we came up with uh, the idea of the seniors navigator that will fulfill most, if not all, the roles that the, a seniors advocate will. And, um, uh, we will continue to, uh, to work to improve this position. I know that the member and I uh, across have, have talked to the leader of the third party recently, and he's a little concerned about the, the amount of responsibility that a seniors navigator will have, because it is very broad in scope. And um, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, we will look at uh, expanding those services as need be. So Mr. Speaker, um, the Seniors Navigator, uh, to close, will help to advocate for seniors and connect them to the many valuable programs and services available to them. And really, Mr. Speaker, the whole goal is to help make the lives of seniors better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and this is indeed um, welcome news. Um, when I was a child, I was often told, as I'm sure we all were, to respect our elders. And so before I developed the ability to kind of consider things from other perspectives and to believe that that might not be something that everyone does just never dawned on me. And so um, to see seniors struggling and not be able to access services, not be aware of services, and to feel alone in a lot of cases um, is just incomprehensible to me. And so having a position such as this, I think, will definitely help our seniors be able to, to not only access the services, but to become aware of those services. And I, as the minister um, t talked about the leader of the third party having concerns about the large responsibility that this is, I, I too have concerns about that because of the, the amount of calls that we receive from our island seniors in need of help navigating or understanding services is quite quite large and so so I do worry about that responsibility one more thing I, I might like some more well I would like some more details on would be around what sort of independence this navigator has if if they bring barriers forward if they bring ideas forward if this is something that will actually be heard and translated into to positive change or if it will be one of the other things that are just kind of um, swept aside um, so so I really hope that this would not be the case and that they would have the autonomy to bring forward um, the voice of island seniors. I think that this is very welcome and um, I look forward to hearing more about this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you. Speaker, and I too uh, certainly want to rise and, and talk to this and thank the Minister for his cooperation and uh, this announcement here today. You know, we all have parents and grandparents and we all know the sacrifices they made for us to be where we are today. And, 
you know, each uh, generation tried to make it easier for their children, us included. And, you know, when I see seniors and I see them having difficulties navigating whatever it is, a system with government, which, you know, it's not that the systems are that cumbersome, it's that they don't have the technology to do it. Not everybody has a computer. Then you get other seniors that just, they're better on computers than some of us in here, which is great. And uh, I, I can't say enough about this. And, and you know, we had, I had been working on an advocate for the reason that they would be a separate identity, sort of like the child advocate or the ombudsman, and they would answer to the Legislative Assembly rather than Executive Council. But this is a good, positive first step. Depending on their responsibilities, and as the Minister said, we'll look at this going forward, but I want to say how great this is today and thank the Minister and everyone involved. Thank you all. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government has been clear that we intend on doing everything we can to fight climate change. As part of that ongoing effort, I am pleased to share that the Department of Fisheries and Communities has begun work to develop the first ever seafood environmental impact reduction plan. This new green, tech, new green strategy builds on the excellent work of our island fishers and due to preserve our natural environments. Mr. Speaker, look at the North Shore, North Shore Oyster Company and the PEI Aquaculture Alliance. North Shore Oyster Company built a solar-powered feeding system for their oyster nursery fishery, and the Aquaculture Alliance replaced 87,000 styrofoam buoys with more non-eco-friendly ones. They're all, all great ideas that island companies are implemented to both protect the in, in, environment and to innovate their business. The strategy is underway. It will be evidence-based and rely on the expertise of leading research and industry innovators. The department will be working closely with the seafood sector, other government departments, and of course, other levels of government, because this is a team effort. In fact, it's a global effort. Mr. Speaker, these discussions happened at the COP26 in Scotland right now and are very things we are doing here, right here in Prince Edward Island. We all want to do our part to preserve the environment for future generations. We want this generation of fishers and aquacultures to be the best to pass on to their children an environment where they can fish and farm in the waters around us. We want the seafood industry to th thrive, to continue being a leader in delivering world-class products. Mr. Speaker, as I said, this new strategy will help us identify and implement sustainable green changes. Staff are, giving, get, staff are gathering information about best practices that will reach out to the various fishery, aquaculture, and seafood processing associations for their input in the new year. Mr. Speaker, we know that there are many opportunities for the aquaculture, the commercial fishers, and the seafood processors to make positive environmental changes for the future of this province. This strategy will be an evolving guide to the ways we can work together on initiatives to help us realize PEI's net zero energy goals. Mr. Speaker, I hope all members of the House will encourage the people they know in the fishing and island community and aquaculture community to have the voices reflected in the strategy. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to sharing this final strategy in the early next fall. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for bringing this forward. This is an important initiative, and I think it's timely, given the conversations that are happening in uh, Glasgow right now. For, with COP26, having a strategy on how we're going to reduce a carbon footprint in the industry is a wonderful thing, but even beside that, the profound impacts that climate change are going to have on the fishing community in particular are potentially devastating. This is an industry that is at great risk with the ocean acidification, the impacts it's going to have on that industry is going to be profound. So looking for opportunities to create a strategy to be part of the solution is absolutely a wonderful thing. And I hope the minister will share details on how the fishing community can be involved and where they can um, send their feedback or participate in data collection on this as it gets off the ground. But I thank the minister for this initiative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thought the Minister was going to stand up here and re-announce the economic impact of the fisheries on PEI for the fifth time. So I'm really, really happy to see that it was a new announcement and that uh, you know, they're taking steps in reducing the environmental uh, impact on the uh, seafood sector. Um, we have to do everything we can to, to fight climate change. We need to find that balance to, to protect um, 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 our natural environment and also to protect um, one of our main industri industries here on Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. So I want to thank the Department of Staff and all those in the sector who have uh, provided input into this who, uh, for their cooperation now and into the future. And I look forward to this announcement being made a few more times in this House. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Teaching at any level is a rewarding career, but early childhood educators have a special opportunity to help children in their earliest stages. Mr. Speaker, this is Early Childhood Educator Week, a time to recognize and celebrate the exceptional educators who support our children to grow, learn, play, and thrive in their early years the most rapid period of development in a human's life. Early childhood educators in our province are amazing. I myself have a three and a five year old at an early year center and not a day goes by that I'm not thankful for the wonderful support our family receives, the teaching they provide and the fun they both have. When we pick them up at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, and they are smiling and happy, we know that they had a great day and that is made possible by the incredible staff we have in early years across this province. Chaque jour, les éducateurs de la petite enfance de la province créent des environnements qui favorisent le développement des enfants et inspirent la curiosité et l'amour de l'apprentissage. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we want to continuously support our early childhood educators. On October 1st, we int introduced wage increases, and in the weeks ahead, we will be introducing new training pathways to support educators who want to further their education. Early childhood educators will have access to accelerated and asynchronous post-secondary learning programs to enhance their education, their level of expertise, and their salary. We are grateful for the educators we currently have, but as we grow and expand our system, the need for more staff in this sex sector will also expand. So we want to encourage all Islanders to consider a career in early childhood education. Within the next week, the Early Childhood Development Association of Prince Edward Island will open applications for the next intake to the Steps to Success program funded through Skills PEI. Anyone who has ever been interested in a career in the early years, this is the time to take that next step. Through this fully funded program, participants can earn and they, as they learn. Steps to Success provides both training as well as practical work experience at a child care centre on Prince Edward Island. At the completion of the program, participants will have earned their Level 1 Early Childhood Educator Certification. Mr. Speaker, we highly value our early childhood educators and all those who work at childhood, child care centers, as they play a vital role in providing our youngest islanders with a strong start. Thank you to everyone working within our early learning and child care sector, and happy Early Childhood Educators Week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside Safe Drive. Mr. Speaker, and it, I mean, it, it sounds like we're going to be focusing on recruitment again, but uh, from the early childhood educators I speak with, we've got to focus on retention as well. There's a, they're dedicated to a fault with all the unpaid work they do because they care. Uh, they certainly are. They do, they do help build a foundation that stays with our population for life, so they're absolutely essential to a, a happy and healthy life here in Prince Edward Island. But just as with our nurses and our other healthcare workers, we need to ensure our early childhood educators, as vital, vital components of a healthy, healthy population, are given the appreciation and support they deserve every week. So I join the minister in saying happy ECE week, early childhood educators, but it, it's, it's not a week that we have to keep this up, uh, minister. We have to do this all the time, and we have to make sure that the work-life balance of all of the workers that are employed by our government are taken into consideration all the time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty, third party House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this is a, a great announcement, our ministerial that the minister made. And you know, you often talk to kids at that age, and if you get into a conversation with them, 
they often, it's not too far, sometimes they talk about their parents, but oftentimes they talk about the, the people that they're working with and, the, and what's happening at those facilities, and that's no accident. Um, and it's because of the early childhood educators that work so hard to build that relationship and give, uh, give the kids in those facilities everything they possibly need. And I just want to thank you, thank them, and, uh, and say I hope you have a great week because um, we know they care deeply and uh, we, we value what they do every single day. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of Minister's Statements, presenting and receiving petition. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table the report of the Auditor General New Brunswick, of New Brunswick 2020, and I move, seconded by the Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, that the said ta document be re now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave of the House, sorry, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a document titled, Medivy Goes to Court to Keep Details of Ambulance, contract, ambulance Contracts Secret. Um, and I move, seconded by Charlottetown Belvedere, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. By uh, leave the House, I beg to table a document from the PEI ATV Federation titled Province Asked to Help Develop an Island Plan for ATV in Future. And I move, second by the Minister of Economic Development, and Tourism and Culture, that said document be now be received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Any others? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a copy of Medivy's website in which they refer to themselves as a not-for-profit health care solutions partner, Mr. Speaker. And I move seconded by uh, the Honourable Minister of Finance uh, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Uh, the Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I present here uh, with a message from Her Honour, the Honourable Antoinette Perry, the Lieutenant Governor of Prince Edward Island, which said message is signed by Her Honour. Honourable members, I'll ask you to stand while the clerk reads the message from Her Honour. Dear Mr. Speaker, Her Honour, the Honourable Antoinette Perry, Lieutenant Governor of the Province of Prince Edward Island, hereby transmits the supplementary estimates of expenditure of the Province of Prince Edward Island in support of the Supplementary Appropriation Act No. 2, 2021, that were required to carry out the public services of the province for the fiscal years ending March 31st, 2020, March 31st, 2021, and March 31st, 2022. In accordance with the provisions of the Constitution Act 1867, the Prince Edward Island Terms of Union 1873, and the Financial Administration Act, Her Honour recommends the same to the Legislative Assembly. Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I present herewith the supplementary estimates of expenditure for the province of Prince Edward Island in support of the Supplementary Appropriation Act No. 2, 2021, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that the same be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that consideration of the supplementary estimates in committee of the whole House be added to the orders of the day until such time as they are dispatched. Shall it carry? Yeah. Any other tabling of documents? I miss anyone? Reports by committees. The Honourable Member for Molecule Kilmore and the Government Whip. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, following the receipt of the Committee's report on committee activities on November Second, 2021. I move, seconded by the honourable member from O'Leary and Burness, that the report of the committee be adopted. On May 12, 2021, the Legislative Assembly passed a motion to refer the study of a sustainable irrigation strategy to your committee. Your committee prioritized this topic and conducted a series of meetings on considerations for the development of such a strategy. And as a result of its del deliberations, your committee is pleased. To was pleased to make eight recommendations. I won't uh, go through the trouble of reading them all out, and, but I just wanted to make mention that uh, your committee also thanks the Department of 
of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action for their collaboration as the process is as the process has proven to allow for stakeholder input to be considered simultaneously to the committee's receipt of the information. Your committee is pleased that with the department's work thus far on the creation of the irrigation strategy and looks forward to its final form and, and imp implementation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any other members that wish to speak to the re report? No? Should I carry? Carry, carry. Introduction of government bills. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be entitled Appropriation Act of Capital Expenditures 2022, and I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall I carry? Bill number 40, Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures 2022, read a first time. Supplement or overview, Minister? I think, Mr. Speaker, Appropriation Act is the legislation supporting the budgetary plan put forward in, the, in my House statement. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be entitled Supplementary Appropriation Act No. 2, 2021, and I move second by the Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall I carry? Bill No. 41, Supplementary Appropriation Act No. 2, 2021, read a first time. Overview, Minister? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The schedule attached to this act lists the total amount of special warrants approved under the authority of the Financial Administration Act since the last sitting of this House. That's it somewhere. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land Minister of Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I beg to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Prince Edward Island Lands Protection Act, and I move and seconded by the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier that the sa same be now received and read the first time. Shall I carry? <laughs> Bill number 42, an act to amend the Prince Edward Island Land Protection Act number two, read a first time. Overview, Minister. These amendments are being introduced to address recommendations by the Lands Matter Advisory Committee and will strengthen investigative and enforcement powers under the Act. The proposed amendments include changes to definitions, outlying direction and in indirect control of corporations, adding a requirement for, for corporations to apply amended permission when it comes to shareholders and changes to the land's holding, and updating investigation enforcement offense provision under the Act. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Minister of Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to introduce a bill to be intituled the, an Act to amend the Planning Act, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier that the sa same be now received and read the first time. Sure, I carry. Yeah. Bill number 43, an act to amend the Planning Act number two, read a first time. Overview, Minister. Mr. Speaker, these amendments are being introduced to address the recommendations by the Land Advisory, Land Matters Advisory Committee. The proposed amendments will bring clear purpose to outline the scope of the act and introduce a statement of provincial interest to help guide land, land planning. No more bills? The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask Motion 68 be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Motion 68. The Member for Mermaid Stratford moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown Victoria Park, the following motion. Whereas incontinence impacts hundreds of persons with vaginas and often the only solution they are provided is surgery. And whereas there is physiotherapy available to strengthen pelvic floor health and which can resolve a significant portion of cases without the need for invasive surgery. And whereas urinary incontinence is the top reason people, mostly women, seek pelvic floor health. And whereas hormonal changes, trauma such as childbirth and life stress can affect the pelvic floor and interfere with its function. And whereas besides dementia, incontinence is, the major, is a major reason why persons with vaginas are admitted to long-term care. 
Early preventative intervention may reduce the long-term cost to our health care system and quality of life for our senior persons with vaginas. And whereas education is a key component of improving pelvic floor health, both for individuals and health care providers. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to promote an education campaign on pelvic floor health, health and prevention. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to fund pelvic floor exams and treatment for island seniors. I'll ask the member from Mermaid Stratford and the opposition host leader to start debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would suggest that this is the first time that we're probably going to talk about pelvic floor health on the floor of the Legislative Assembly. And um, I'm very excited to be able to bring forward this motion. Um, as you're all aware, I took over as the um, health critic for the official opposition around June. And immediately what I started doing was reaching out to people in the community to find out what, is, what are some needs? And I had a significant number of women that reached out to me. Um, and they talked about all sorts of things, um, including endometriosis, um, including um, pap smears, uh, breast um, mammog mammograms. Um, the list just goes on. And what I realized is women's health is something that is extremely important. It impacts 50% plus of the, of the population of PEI, but we just don't talk about it enough. So, Mr. Speaker, I had a physiotherapist um, that practices in my district reach out to me, and, and she, was offering, um, she was offering a seminar on women's health, and the focus was on pre- and postnatal. And uh, her name was Lana McDonald, and I, I walked into the room. Well, she sent it to me probably thinking I would actually just share it on Facebook or whatever social media to make awareness, and obviously I did that. But I actually signed up for it because I thought, I don't know what this is about, and it's about women's health, and I wanted to become more informed. So when I attended the health seminar, um, there was five extraordinary women that were... Um, lined up to share their knowledge. And there was probably a dozen women that were in that room. I've said on the floor of this legislature before, magic happens when you put women together in small groups and ask them to share their experience. Um, there's just an honesty that happens that, to me, doesn't happen anywhere else. And we often need to feel comfortable in a space to be able to have those conversations. So the discussions that were happening um, by these healthcare providers was all different aspects of women's health. They were speaking about pelvic floor, they were speaking to nutrition, to massage therapy, mental health and fitness, and how they all work together in order to ensure that women who are going through pregnancy and postpartum are well supported in the whole process of being, um, of being pregnant in childbirth. And the pelvic floor part of it, um, I haven't actually been in a room where pelvic floor health is talked um, deeply and honestly about um, in a long time. And you would think that that's something that all of us would understand what, what our pelvic floor is and just how important it is to our anatomy. Um, but what it struck me from the information that was provided in this session is information that women and girls should know from the moment that they start their periods. And it impacts us right until the time that we die. And it's something that is not taught um, honestly in schools. We often brush over the, the, our anatomies, especially when it's talking about our pelvis. And unfortunately, that hurts people, and they don't actually know what services are available to them. And I think that we need to start talking more openly about it, because it's just talking about the anatomy. Something else has struck me, and I just, I hope everybody hears this, um, especially the women that are listening. The other thing that was shared with me was, any amount of incontinence is not normal. And if you're sitting in a room of women and they tell you, or you say that to them, I guarantee you that a big percentage of the women in that room are gonna go, really? Like, think about that. 
We don't know what's normal with our own bodies because we've never been taught what's normal with our own bodies. Mr. Speaker, um, I was compelled to book a pelvic floor, pelvic floor assessment out, coming out of that, out of that session. Um, like I said, the session was about um, po about uh, perinatal, postnatal, um, and obviously it's been a long time since I've had a child. It's been 12 years, but I haven't had the health care that I should have probably had 12 years ago when I had my daughter. And so I booked the um, pelvic floor assessment, and I, w once it was booked, I got an intake form. And that intake form was pages long. I've never seen anything like it. They talked about um, urgency. They talked about incontinence. They talked about intercourse. They talked about menstruation. They talked about abdominal, abdominal pain. They talked about childbirth. They asked, how stressed are you at home? and at work. How do you sleep? How's your eating habits? Do you drink enough water? And I'm going through this going, yes, yes, I have that. Yes, I have that. Of course, since I'm a child, I've been like that. And when I actually got into the room and we had the assessment, my mind was blown by how all these questions that really just got my mind thinking um, all kind of came together as my health care and how my health care probably wasn't as good as it should have been. Um, the beginning of the assessment is a full anatomy lesson of our, of our pelvic regions. Um, and our pelvis, it holds much of our major organs, right? It holds the bladder. And I'll get into that, but let me tell you, like, there's not a lot of room down there, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's quite complex, and it's, we don't talk about it very much, and we need to. When how she made me feel comfortable in the room is she just talked about just how normal it is for women to require help with their pelvic floor health. Um, I was set at ease, and then we got down to business talking about why this all matters. So we talked about the pelvic floor. We talked about prolapse. I'm not sure if people know what a prolapse is, but I'm going to get into it. I'm going to be very specific, because I think we need to actually get down into the weeds and talk about women's health. We talked about plessary rings. We talked about what stress in our work, in our life, in our family, like just home life, what stress does to our pelvic floor. I had no idea. I was completely oblivious to it. Um, and then we started talking about preventative measures. So there, the discussion that I had with that, with that health provider just set me at ease and made me realize I'm not alone. And I'll tell you a story, actually, Mr. Speaker. When I was at an exercise class, um, one of the exercises that, we, that they got us to do was to jump in front of a wall and tap up high. And the woman who was standing next to me said, and now we all pee a little. And I looked at her thinking, I thought it was just me. But you know what, Mr. Speaker, it was the entire row. Every single, sorry. Every single woman knew that they had a problem. And it was, that was normal. But I'm gonna go back to, no amount of incontinence is normal. But we don't talk about it. It's a secret. And this is women's health that we're talking about. And we need to talk about it more openly. And we need to make it more of a priority. So what's the pelvic floor? It's just a group of muscles. It's like if you go to, uh, if you go to um, a trainer uh, at a gym, and you're working on your biceps, and you know they were to touch your bicep to make sure that you're you engaging the right sort of muscles. Well, you can imagine with pelvic, with uh, your pelvic floor, a lot of people have no clue what those muscles are or what it feels like to engage them. And with the help of um, the physiotherapist that I that I saw. What they did was exactly that. They did the touching. It was part of the, exter the internal exam. They touched the muscle so that when you actually engaged the muscle, you knew where that muscle was. And I can say, like, um, 
speaking to some seniors about this, when we talked about um, when we talked about the, me bringing this to the floor of the legislature, they were shocked that I was going to do it. And I can't express how many people have responded to me saying, yes, pelvic floor health should be part of public health. It, sh it shouldn't just be something that people who have private health care insurance can go and, and engage a physiotherapist or wait you know, months, possibly years, to get a specialist to help them. Pelvic floor health should actually be part of public health. Um, so the pelvic floor, it's a group of muscles. It's between the tailbone and the pubic bone within the pelvis. Men and women both have it. Um, they support your intestines, your bowels, your bladder with women. It also supports the vagina and the uterus. Muscular bands encircle the urethra, the vagina and anus as they pass through the pelvic floor. We all have it. We just don't talk about it because we don't talk about that stuff. So we're talking about it today, Mr. Speaker. So this is the part of the anatomy, like I said, gets seldomly discussed, especially here on this, legislat this legislature floor. I would point to the composition of, you know, gender. And I would suggest that that's probably a big reason why um, something like this probably hasn't been discussed on the floor of the legislature before. Having a healthy pelvic floor, life-changing. It's absolutely life-changing. When you don't have a healthy public pelvic floor, it impacts every single day. People live with it every single day, especially women with vaginas. Sorry, especially people with vaginas, including women. When pelvic floor muscles are weak, they can create problems with, with the bladder, bowel control. After dementia, did you know that incontinence is actually one of the top reasons why women enter long-term care? Imagine that. After dementia, incontinence is one of the leading reasons why people need long-term care. Imagining, imagine how limiting that is. Imagining, imagine saying, I can't go for a walk because I don't know if I'm actually going to be able to make it to a bathroom by the time I come home. You can't go watch your child play soccer because there's no public bathrooms close enough for you to be able to find a bathroom So in case you have an accident. Imagine the hesit hesitancy of actually leaving your home when you are dealing with this. But Mr. Speaker, many people just think it's normal. But it's not. It's absolutely not normal and there's help out there. Part of the challenge is, is many people within our health care system don't know that the help is available. One physiotherapist that I was speaking with got involved and took the training to do pelvic floor health assessments because she was contacted by a specialist, um, a urologist, who had an extreme waiting list. And he said, do you practice this? Because there's several people on my wait list that I think can actually have preventative measures to control and to improve the pelvic floor health, and they don't have to have invasive surgery. That's life changing. If you can do it through proper, through different exercises that a physiotherapist gives you, we do it for our knees, we do it for our shoulders, why don't we do it for pel pelvic floor? Lots of people assume the pelvic floor is predominantly weakened by pr have pregnancy and childbirth, and yes, absolutely it is. But let me tell you that it also comes from stress. It also comes from um, some cancer treatments. It comes from several different reasons. People who've never had a baby before have this issue, but you know what? Because they haven't had a baby or they're not trying to have a baby, it's not talked about with them. Have you ever looked at an image of the pelvis with the organs inside it and seen how jammed up it is? There's a lot of stuff in there. There's your intestines, your bowels, everything's in there. So there's not a whole lot of extra room to put a full grown baby inside that pelvis. A full grown baby on top of everything else that's full before you ever get pregnant. So all those organs get squished and squeezed up to different places 
and it's literally mind blowing. Like when you look at it and you see what the contortions that happens to the female body when they have a baby in their uterus, in their womb, the female pelvis is an absolute powerhouse. So why don't we talk about it more? And why don't we ensure that it's healthy? When muscles are tight, women experience pain. This is also felt, this is often felt through intercourse. And often, women go to their physicians to talk about having pain during intercourse because it impacts the marital unit. It impacts their marriage. But a little known fact, Mr. Speaker, by having tense pelvic floor muscles is part of the issue. So why isn't just part of our public health? It also contributes to cramping, heaviness in the pelvic area, lower back, your stomach. And despite it being typical, being a typical add-on to getting your period, um, the severe pain is often something that people don't flag because they think it's normal, but it's actually more serious than that. It can be endometriosis or a whole list of other, um, other serious uh, conditions that women experience. So what happens when your uh, pelvic floor is weak? What can happen is your organs can sag and your organs can actually protrude outside the body. That's serious. Um, it's called a prolapse. And I suggest that everybody kind of look at it and see there's four stages from not severe to severe and it's, there's four categories. Just this week we had somebody call into our office to tell us that they had a level three which meant that their, pro, that their um, bladder had prolapsed outside of her body. And when she called her doctor, her doctor told her this was an emergency. Three times she tried to get help and she's now being told that it's years before she's gonna get the surgery that she needs. Do you know for a plissory ring, which is the ring that is inserted in order to hold your organs in, it's a four year wait list. A four year wait list to get your organs to a point where they're being held in your body because it's a woman issue. A gynecologist and OBGYN is somebody who we often, um, that we often uh, refer people to whenever they're having prolapse or whenever they're having pelvic floor health issues. But Mr. Speaker, there's physiotherapists here within PEI that actually do a lot of preventative work. And one of the exercises, and people, on, people that are watching, especially if you're an older generation, would, would hear of Kegels, where you flex your muscle, your pelvic floor muscles. But part of the challenge is, is a lot of people don't know what that feels like, so they're actually flexing their bums or tightening their bellies or whatever, and they're doing it wrong, but you don't know if you're doing something wrong unless somebody points it out. And so during a pelvic floor health assessment, they'll actually put their finger on the muscles and they'll flick it. And she'll say, pick up the blueberry. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever heard that before, but if you've, if you've gone to see a pelvic floor health physiotherapist, you've heard, pick up the blueberry. Now do it quicker, because what it does is it trains your muscles in your pelvic floor to tighten whenever you cough, tighten when you sneeze. Do you know how many women sneeze and have an accident? You could be at a fancy dinner and you sneeze and then you have to leave because you're embarrassed because of what's just happened because that's what your body has done. It's serious. And we really need to start advocating to ensure that services for women's health are readily available. Because if they're not, we are forcing people into a state of staying home. And when people stay home, we know what that leads to. It leads to loneliness, it leads to more deterioration of the body, it leads to muscles that are um, even more, like deteriorate even more because you're not walking, you're not exercising, you're not getting out, and we know what that does to people. So Mr. Speaker, I know, um, I just, I could go on. I could literally go on about this for days because I understand now just how important it is and how simple it is to get help. But one of the things that we don't do is we don't support people in order to get that help. So if you have private health care insurance, you can engage a floor, pelvic floor physiotherapist 
and um, and book an appointment and pay the $125 in order to get the first assessment. That's a lot of money for a senior. That's a lot of money for a single mom. That's a lot of money with somebody at home with a couple of kids. And that is a deterrent for them to be able to actually take care of the health the way that they need to. So Mr. Speaker, this motion is calling for two things. It's calling to, pr to promote an educational campaign on public floor health, the help that's out there, the, prevent the preventions that are available. And when I say that, I say that as island-wide for all healthcare workers, all, everybody, put it in the schools, put it in to any kind of place where <laughs> you have people who, and I'm gonna tell you, if, we're everywhere people that are dealing with this, this situation were everywhere. And it's an education system that needs to happen. You know, there was a, I was told um, a story of a physician who talked about childbirth and how much damage it does to, the woman, to a woman's body and suggested, you know, if he had the choice, he'd take every, he'd take every woman early and do a cesarean section so that they wouldn't have a lifetime of dealing with the repercussions of having a child. That's not how you deal with it. You deal with it through education, you deal with it through providing the services, and you deal with it through prevention so that the natural process of childbirth can happen. So the other thing that I'm calling for in this, in this uh, motion, Mr. Speaker, is to urge government to fund public floor exams and treatment for island seniors. And I don't care what their, I don't care what their, uh, um, what their income criteria, uh, what their income level is. I think that this is something that every single island senior should have the opportunity to be able to access. And at the cost of it, it is not accessible. But I had a psychologist, Mr. Speaker, who reached out to me after I sp first spoke about this. And she said, um, I, have a, I have a client who can't leave her home, but she also can't afford to buy the Depends or whatever, whatever um, pads and that kind of thing, whatever she was buying, she can't afford it. We've talked about this in, in the Legislative Assembly. I mean, we talked about it with, men's, with menstruation um, and periods, right, and how women have to buy just to be able to go to school, just to be able to go to work, just to be able to do our daily stuff. We have to buy pads and tampons, and it's a cost that other people don't have to, to pay, but it's just, that's the way our bodies work. This is something that we can change lives with if we all agree that, the, that um, we make the education accessible to people and that we make the funding available to help people with um, the preventative um, component of dealing with um, pelvic floor health that may not be as healthy as it needs to be in order for us to function every day. And I do hope that um, I've explained it well enough so that people know what I'm talking about. Um, I do hope that anybody out there that is watching, um, that you do seek help if this is something that you are dealing with. But I ask everybody to talk to your children, talk to your sisters, talk to your aunts, talk to your grandparents, talk, just talk. If you're a teacher, talk to your kids. Like, if you are a healthcare worker, talk to your patients. This is just something that needs to be talked about. And we need to understand it better. And Mr. Speaker, I could talk forever, but I'm going to give other people an opportunity. And I really do hope that everybody takes the time to recognize just how beneficial this could be for many Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll call on the seconder of the motion, the Honorable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Charlottetown Victoria Park, seconder. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and it's, a real, it's an honor to rise and speak to this motion. I will give some personal stories to back up the very um, great explanation by, by my colleague. I'd like to start by thanking um, Amy Morse and Ava King, who are our two grade nine students upstairs, uh, who helped in this discussion very much, giving us um, a perspective of a grade nine student who is currently in our, in our system. And so they offered a really unique perspective to this conversation and 
it was a real breath of fresh air to have that with us today. Um, Mr. Speaker, we have a real problem in understanding the health needs and providing health, proper health services for persons with vaginas. And we put it like that, understanding that it's not just women who have vaginas. We too often have trouble understanding this. And Mr. Speaker, it brought to mind a story that, that I was encouraged to share down here. I taught grade one, grade three, and junior high sexual education. And the first thing I would do at every single level, because of course when you talk about your body parts, because we don't ever talk about them, um, it makes people giggle. And so before I started any sexual education lesson, I would say, all right, I want everyone to stand up, and I want everyone to say, vagina, vagina, vagina. And so they would, and then they would giggle, and then I would say, okay, now I want everyone to say, penis, 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 and they would, and they would giggle. And, and I just wanted, it's, it's a body part, it's a part of your anatomy, it's science, and you know, there's no reason why, why you shouldn't be comfortable talking about it. Um, pelvic floor health is something that I had no concept of prior to having children. And afterwards, it seemed that conversation opened right up and um, I recognize it for the huge issue that it is and even experiencing incontinence myself Mr. Speaker I may divulge too much information but whatever um, I often wear a maxi pad if I'm going somewhere where I know I'm gonna laugh really hard because if I'm standing up and laughing hard I'm probably going to pee my pants <laughs> gravity is not my friend <laughs> Um, but my, pel my story on pelvic floor health doesn't stop there Mr. Speaker um, the lack of understanding on this issue leaves um, those with vagina living in pain, discomfort, and feeling very much alone. So I share my story today recognizing that every single person with a vagina has a story. Um, so uh, I'll share mine. Um, so as some of you may remember, this past spring and summer I spent a lot of time standing behind my chair at our committee meetings. And that's because I might get a bit emotional here because I don't usually talk about this, but um, so I was having some back pain, which was quite severe, and it turned into sciatica, which if you're familiar with that, is the pain kind of in your butt cheek that goes down your leg. Um, and I'd had it before, but this lasted much longer, was much more painful, and I still have impacts from that that I'm working through. So I was in such severe pain for three days, I could not stand, I could not sit, I could not walk, let alone sleep. I canceled a meeting with the Minister of Health over there because I couldn't, I just couldn't function. Um, so at this point in time in my life, I gained a whole new understanding and appreciation for those living in chronic pain. I was lucky enough that my debilitating pain only lasted for three days and as a result the, the leg muscles in my right leg have weakened and walking which I, I used to love to do is incredibly frustrating for me now hoping that will work itself out um sorry so I went to see a physiotherapist the same physiotherapist I had when I broke my arms and an acupuncturist and we were working through things and I'd been seeing my doctor as well. It took me a bit longer to get in to see my doctor and so I went and he recommended an x-ray and he called me one morning, I was on my way into work and he told me I had degenerative, degenerative disc disease. So I got off the phone and I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? Am I gonna be in a wheelchair in six months? How fast does it degenerate? Will the pain ever go away? Like, will, my, will I get the strength back in my leg? What does that mean? And so I went, I had an appointment that same day, thank goodness, with my physiotherapist and acupuncturist, which both told me that, oh my gosh, that's no big deal. He said, if, if everyone in the world had that x-ray um, over the age of 30, they would probably be diagnosed with degener degenerative disc disease. It's just the regular wear and tear on your back. And um, it, it's degenerated, it's not degenerating, which was very reassuring. So I kept going to my appointments and it kind of seemed like I had a bit of a, a stop in my healing process. So a good friend of mine and colleague mentioned that I should go see an osteopath, which I recognize the privilege of being able to say that. I have health insurance and I'm able to pay for those appointments. So if I weren't, I would never have known that these back issues were related to my pelvic floor health. One of the first questions the osteopath <coughs> asked me is if I had a C-section. And I said, well, yes, actually, I've had two. And he said, do you often suffer from dizziness and heartburn? And I said, uh, yes, I do. Um, 
and so he kind of went on his work and I explained I was there for a back issue. I was skeptical he'd be able to help because it was a, you know, a disc thing, I thought. And anyway, he, I could tell that he was thinking something and that he was, so he was working through his thing and he ended up telling me, I, you know, he, he said that, he talked about my C-section and he said, I think I'm right. I think, I think that you are suffering from not healing properly from your C-section. He said, your doctor would have been looking for, you know, that there was no infection and that it was healing properly. He said, but that's not all they should be looking for. And when he said that, I started thinking back to when I broke my arms and I had two surgeries on my right arm. And when I went to the same physiotherapist, Marcel McDonald at Reactive Health, um, I remember he massaged my scar for like 15 minutes every time I went in. Yet here I had a, like a huge invasive surgery and uh, you know, you sl put some s um, stitches in there, put a little thing to catch the drips <laughs> and um, that's it. You get your stitches out and you're expected to go on with your life. But the way the osteopath explained it to me was that all of the organs that are in there, just as the member had mentioned previously, that's a, so invasive, and, and when they go in there it, and it heals, your organs don't have the, um, is it malleability, is that the word I'm looking for? They don't, they don't move together like they do. And so therefore he explained that it's pulling everything, including my back. He said, it's making you dizzy, it's giving you heartburn. and he explained it much better than I did, but it was all connected to my C-section. And, and so I thought, oh, well, then that's, it that I'm gonna live with this forever and he said but I can fix that and so I went for my third appointment on Monday night and I can I can't even tell you how much better I feel now there's some work that I'm that I'm doing on my own but when after he he does the, the work on me I realize how much I've been disconnected from that part of my body as I was healing it was so I mean just take a minute for anyone who hasn't experienced a c-section this isn't a pity party but a reality I mean, you're caught. You have a, a scar that big in, in, like, in your belly, below your belly, right above, in, like, it is, you can't stand up. You're in your bed, and they're asking you to move, like, just hours after you've had that surgery. It's, it's quite something. And then, so you kind of baby that area so much that when life returns to normal, you, I, I didn't even realize that I wasn't quite returning to normal because I was, had babied that for so long and it was like, you know, you didn't go near there um, that I was disconnected. And so that's, and reading a bit more on pelvic floor health, that's also a huge part of, of um, the recovery process. Um, so another thing that he mentioned, he said, he kind of gave me some exercises to do, and he said, there's going to come a point in time where you start bawling, and you're gonna bawl, and you're gonna bawl, and you're gonna bawl, and you're not gonna stop. And he said, the more traumatic your childbirth was, your C-section, your childbirth was, um, the worse it's gonna be. And my first um, child, uh, we both almost died um, in childbirth, so I expected that to be quite profound. It hasn't quite happened yet. I've been doing the exercises, but haven't gotten to that part yet. So <laughs> until we get there, I'm going to think I'm not completely healed. Um, but a good cry always feels good, so I'm not scared of those. Um, but we got to talking, and he said, Carla, I can't believe that we're still here. He said, you wouldn't believe the amount of women that come in here with a completely, seemingly unrelated issue, and I tell them it has to do with their childbirth and the after effects and to their body. And he said, I would love to get to a point where, you know, where modern medicine and where we could all work together. He said, people don't, some people don't respect what I do and they don't see it as real. Um, he said, I wish that we could get to a point where we did because whatever works for someone's health is legit. And um, so, Mr. Speaker, as, as the honorable mem member also mentioned, it's been eight years since I, I gave birth to a child and I don't plan on doing it again. Um, and it's just now that I'm learning that all of this is very normal. And, I, and I'm not a senior yet, so I haven't had to go through my whole life with this pain and discomfort and this disconnect from my body and what a shame that is. Um, Mr. Speaker, people with vaginas are amazing creatures. Their bodies have the potential to do such amazing things like childbirth, for example. 
we should then expect to have different health experiences. And we should never expect that our health concerns are the same. And I guess we even should come to a point where we expect to be surprised when it comes to um, the health of people with vaginas. Um, let's educate our young men and women about this. Let's normalize this for people so that we can strengthen both physically and mentally before this becomes an issue for, for most of us because it certainly will become an issue. Um, so with that, Mr. Speaker, I um, encourage us all to support this motion and to share our stories if we feel so inclined. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there anyone else? The, the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to sincerely thank the mover and the seconder of uh, the motion for bringing this forward. I know it's, uh, it's not uh, always on a personal basis easy to be able to talk about these things and to share your personal experiences. And I do applaud you for that and uh, thank you for that as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we strongly believe in health and wellness and health PEI in preventative health promoting approaches to wellness. The Department of Health and Wellness, in partnership with other government departments, community organizations, and Islanders who are developing a women and gender diverse Islanders health strategy. The strategy will focus on addressing the factors impacting the health and well being of women and gender diverse Islanders. Mr. Speaker, pelvic floor health is important to all people, and even more so to those who have gone through some of life events, such as hormonal changes, childbirth, etc. Urinary incontinence can be a real concern. Promotion of pe pelvic floor health can help prevent urinary incontinence and help people enjoy more independence as they do age. Mr. Speaker, this initiative fits well with our Provincial Women and Gender Diverse Islanders Health Strategy and other related investments. And Mr. Speaker, I fully support this motion, and I know that Health PEI would support awareness campaigns around this is issue, which would help with what the mover of this motion and the seconder identified as gaps. I know that many people experience this issue and that can be a silent issue that some people are not comfortable in discussing. It is important that we don't let silence get in the way of health education and health service delivery. Once again, Mr. Speaker, I thank the mover and the seconder of this motion for raising this matter. And I do look forward, Mr. Speaker, to working with this House, the mover, and the seconder, and our health providers to promote pelvic floor health in our province. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak to the motion? If not, I'll call on the move to the motion to close debate. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the opposition, House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll make my remarks very very short. I would like to thank the Minister for um, supporting this uh, motion, but I also want to thank the member for being so, sharing so so honestly, and, and I know that it can be really raw when you talk about um, really difficult times in your life, and I think what you shared was beautiful, and I appreciate for you taking the time. And with that, Ms. M Mr. Speaker, I call for the vote. <coughs> Official opposition. Standing vote or just no. Oh, just call the vote. I'll call the vote. Honourable members, the vote question has been called. All those in favour of the motion, please say yay. Yay. All those against the motion, please say nay. Honourable member, your motion passed unanimously. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the Third Party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Tignish Palmer Road that the 25th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by... 
Order number 25, an act to amend the Water Act, Bill number 116, ordered for second reading. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty, and the Third Party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Tignish Palmer Road that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall I carry? Bill number 116, an act to amend the Water Act, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Third Party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Tignish Palmer Road that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration this said bill. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Water Act. Is it a pleasure of the committee that the bill be uh, read clause by clause or open up to a uh, committee of the whole? Chair, General questions? We just have an overview to begin with, Chair. Thank you, uh, Minister of Inf uh, Infrastructure. Uh, yes, uh, could you please uh, provide a quick overview? Sure, thank you very much, Chair. Um, basically, what this bill will do is provide free testing for uh, coliform and E. coli bacteria along with water chemistry um, in well water use as a source of drinking water for, for onlookers. Okay. Thank you, Promoter. Um, so now we will ask if uh, it is the pleasure of the committee that the bill be read clause by clause or open it up to general questions. General questions it is. Chair, um, before we begin, yep. um, I would just like to um, move an amendment. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is, um, so I move, seconded by the uh, member from Charlottetown West Royalty, that Section 1 of Bill 116 is amended in proposed subsection 50.011 by the addition of the words, to owners of wells that are not part of the municipal water supply system or industrial water supply system, after the words drinking water. And I have Do you have copies of that? Yep. I think we'll get those uh, distributed. I'll give you the room. I'll give you the water up. Sorry. Right here. So we'll just wait for the uh, pages to uh, distribute the amendment.
All right, I believe everyone has a copy of uh, the amendment. Um, so first of all, we will open the uh, debate or if there's any questions on the amendment. Charlottetown Brighton? No. Charlottetown Belvedere? It's all right. That's okay, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I'd first like to um, thank the member from um, Tickish Palmer Road for having provided a briefing on this bill and for the work that he has put into um, bringing this forward. Um, we had discussed the amendment um, and I just wanted to sort of confirm with the member that to for perhaps for the record that um, what this does is, is ensure, it provides a clarification that the um, the intent of this bill is to provide the well water, well water testing um, for those who are owners of their own wells and not not um, on municipal water supply and so on. And just it, so it's a matter of just sort of narrowing the scope. If that's if that's correct, perhaps you could just speak to that. Absolutely, member, and thank you for that question. And, and that is exactly why this amendment was, was, amendment was put forward to to show that distinction of what this, the intent of this bill was, and it was for owners. Um, in particular, obviously those in rural PEI um, who have drinking water um, from their own well and not on a municipal system that takes in, you know, taxpayers' dollars to pay for um, the testing of the municipal water. Charlottetown Belvedere. Oh, I'm good, thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for, again. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it was already stated for bringing this forward. Just trying to. Uh, determine why you've limited to just privately owned wells, residential wells, and not municipal water systems. And the reason I ask that is the recent events in, mm -hmm. in Iqaluit where um, the residents were complaining for some time that they thought there was something off with the water. Um, and if they had had the ability to, to go and get the water tested, it may have become um, proven quicker because obviously the municipality, it, it took a while for them to, to mm -hmm. do the test and, and to ascertain that, in fact, it, it was contaminated. Um, Honourable Member, most municipalities, um, that incorporated municipalities that have um, water service to their residents um, collect taxes, and those taxes go towards um, ensuring that the, uh, the municipality is providing clean and safe drinking mm -hmm. water to its residents. Yeah. I guess Minister another, of Transportation Infrastructure. Thanks, Chair. I guess another example mm -hmm. I would bring would be back a number of years ago in, in Walkerton, mm -hmm. which had a municipal uh, mm -hmm. water system, and there was uh, unfortunately fatalities fr mm -hmm. from, from that contamination. So again, yeah, I know it's incumbent upon the municipality mm -hmm. to, to ensure that they're providing safe, potable water to the residents, but there are circumstances, unfortunately, in the past that have been proven not to. And it's my understanding, Minister, great question. So my understanding, I, I would hope that would never happen yeah, um, again anywhere. Yeah. Um, but there are uh, measures in place with the municipalities that they have to continually um, test their drinking water. Um, and Owen Tignish, recently we had an instance where there was a uh, just a change in a part yeah. in the uh, mechanism. The of, yeah, um, and um, they had to wait to get, not that there was really any Thing terrible with the water, but they needed to make to ensure that they had two um, clear tests, um, right. consecutive tests, uh, to pass through before um, the recommendation or it was put back on, and the non-boiling order was uh, removed. Sorry, um, so that was an instance where the municipalities um, take in, take the responsibility uh, to ensure that, that what they're providing to their residents is safe drinking water. Minister of Transportation. So, so basically, oh, sorry. So basically, what this bill is is it's ensuring that the remainder of islanders, rural islanders, um, that they have no barriers to get their water tested, and that we are ensuring that they have um, drinking water that is 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 safe, and they, they deserve to have that. Yeah. So many people, you know, um, I know that we're just talking about the the amendment here, but many people that I've talked to, they want to have that assurance that the water that they're drinking is is clean and it's safe, but they sometimes don't think of it. 
at the time, right? So they put something else off because it's not something that you really see coming out of your sink. It's clear water, yeah. but they don't understand, not don't understand, they don't see that it may contain coliform or some form of bacteria or uh, something may be off in one of the chemistries of it. So um, providing this free drinking um, water testing to those who have their own wells um, will give them that um, opportunity to go get the water tested to ensure that what they're drinking is safe and if it's not to make the necessary changes um, to it. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Shelby, Mem, and Carey? Carey. So now we are back to the bill number 116 and I'm Chair. going to May I make a statement prior to? You can. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I'm, I just want to start that I'm, I'm not an expert <laughs> by any means on, on water chemistry, on drinking water at all. Um, but over the t last 10 years, being uh, a representative for the people in my area, I am somewhat of an expert on what their needs are. Um, and this has been something that has been brought up to me um, often. Um, my office in Tignish on, on Mondays, my constituency office is right next to Access PEI where people come in to uh, collect um, sample bottles and to drop off um, the bottles and there's always complaining about the cost and some of them say, well, I'm only going to be able to do one of the tests, maybe I might do the bacteria one because I don't have the money to do the, the, the chemistry, the full chemistry on it also. Um, and then of course they come to my office to voice their concern over it. Um, so I, I do hear that and uh, you know, I listen and I understand their needs and what they want is that assurance that the water that's coming out of their tap is safe and drink, uh, safe uh, for them to drink um, and that those who can't afford to get that regular testing done um, now know that they can get the testing if this bill goes through, get the testing done and have the assurance that the water that they're drinking and their family is drinking is, is safe and clean. So I, I know that's very important to me coming from a rural area. It's, it's really important, it's really relevant. Um, this particular bill was drafted in early 2020 um, and I, ha I had it drafted then um, so that Islanders obviously could have access to, to safe drinking water and, and to, to the testing of it. Um, but then the pandemic hit um, consultation process was, was stalled, delayed at that time. However, in the last uh, few months, um, the legislation has been updated. I shared a draft with the Department of Environment um, a couple of months ago. Um, I want to acknowledge um, George Summers, who's a manager of drinking water and wastewater management, Todd Dupuy, who's the executive director of climate change and environment, and Laurie Connolly Burns, who's a manager of the analytic lab, uh, along with the deputy minister. Um, and the minister um, for um, meeting with me um, and uh, listening to what I wanted to see in the bill, but also giving recommendations of what they, from their expertise, would work. And this all helped in the development of this bill. Um, so it was a collaborative um, um, approach, and I want to thank them, uh, the minister of and envi um, environment for his um, su support of this. Um, it's really great when you can work um, in, as an opposition party to work, an opposition member to work with um, government to get a bill like this um, on the floor, ready to go on the floor. So, um, and I also want to thank the um, member from the official opposition who is a critic um, for this, uh, for, for environment, for meeting with me and asking me really good questions um, and for um, her interest in providing the same thing that I want, was to ensure that Islanders have access to safe drinking water and there's no barriers there. So I do appreciate um, all that she's done um, to, to, to promote this too. I mean, she did put a, a, a press release out a few months ago um, asking for this. Um, she didn't know that I had this, this bill um, in, the, in the process, so it was timely. And I, I do appreciate her, her, um, her support on this. Um, so at the end of the day, it's, it, what this is, and we all agree, it's, it's about safe drinking water for Islanders who live 
in rural communities, our seniors, our young families, our middle income families. It's about the affordability um, part of it. And it, I believe it has the potential to attract more people to the rural communities here in Prince Edward Island. So um, I, I just, again, want to thank everyone who's been involved so far this process, and I welcome any questions on it. Thank you, Promoter. Um, are there any questions? Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of things to, to clarify as, as much as for the benefit of the House and also the opportunity if there is a, an intervention that's required, we have that chance to mm -hmm. do that through the floor. Um, there is obviously, um, there has been discussion in, in public space uh, and also in this House about the, the fact that there is a, a cost associated with the delivery of this. And to be clear, right now, the water testing is provided by the government office through the um, the analytical laboratories, I think, which is a government entity who charge this fee of around $200 plus for the tests. So with this legislation, um, that that cost is going no longer going to be charged to the, ideally, to the, the participant. Can you just explain how, how um, mm -hmm. that's going to be handled from a fiscal management basis? Because obviously, usually, you know, we, we have to be really careful about yeah. doing something that incurs a cost. And it'd be great to explain sort of what that yeah. looks like. Thank you very much, Member. And that's a great question. And it's a question that I I'd also had posed. Um, because so there is no new costs. Um, the staff is already in place, the lab is already set up, and the, um, uh, the, the equipment is already there. Um, municipalities will still um, have um, to pay, and so will uh, the industrial community. Um, they will have to pay, so there is some revenue coming in there. But So it's not going to have any effect on, on taxpayers' dollars that are not presently there, but it will affect the revenue that comes into that department. So that line will be um, impacted, mm -hmm. but not, um, from my understanding, uh, any any impact on um, new dollars going into it. Charles on Belvedere. Thank you, and, and and obviously, you know, as we had discussed, and there have been discussions sort of, you know, through with the appropriate resources, that's a delicate but important consideration because, mm -hmm. you know, as private members, we, we can't bring forward bills that incur new revenue or taxation lines. And so it, it is a, a nuance, but an important distinction. Yep. Obviously, you know, when we see this, um, that reduction in revenue needs to be picked up from somewhere. And I know that the department is going to have to kind of manage that piece. Mm -hmm. But I, given that you've discussed this with the department, I am having to make the assumption that that they're cool with that, <laughs> but in terms of the, you know, are we are we are we able to support this legislation from that context? It, it removes that that concern of of um, that the, the bill itself is in order, which is a really important one that we want to make sure we can continue to bring forward bills that do this kind of work. Um, Chair, if I may, another question, uh, and that's regarding the the operationalization of this. Um, right now, the workload is determined by people paying and going and I think we all know that when something that was previously charged becomes free you're more likely to see people wanting to go and get that done um, and in addition just it's more complex behind the scenes mm -hmm. sometimes to sort of this isn't as much as we'd like to think it's like flipping a switch it's, it, it's not um, so but, um, could could the um, promoter perhaps speak to the, the proclamation process on this bill, because there isn't a proclamation clause in here, which means I presume it becomes law on royal assent. So if you could speak to that, that process, and it may be something that the department could add to. Thank you very much, uh, member, for that question. And, and uh, uh, again, very important question, um, because, I mean, a bill can be whatever it is, but if it's not uh, proclaimed in law, it's nothing's going to nothing's going to happen. So um, I did pose that question to the minister and asked um, what he, when he thought it was, and his response was that it would be in the first of the new year, So, which is, which is very soon. soon. So uh, first of the new year is what he said, and I, I do um, have trust in our minister. He was someone who was really supportive of this bill, and I don't foresee any problems with that not happening um, in the first of this year. Charles Albert. Thank you, Chair. So, so if I can just qualify, does that mean then you're going to hold off proclaiming the bill until the department is ready to go, or you're going to proclaim it but know that, like the the media piece on that would be, it to take effect because there's nothing, like effectively the way I read this is when it's proclaimed, mm -hmm. it's right then that they become free. 
it's, it's my understanding that after it, hopefully it gets to third reading and is carried. Um, and then, then it's, it is out of my hands, unfortunately, at that time. I have to trust um, those that make those decisions that it will be up and running by the first of the new year. Charles on Belvedere. Um, may I ask for an intervention from the minister, if he could confirm that for the record? You may ask. Uh, the uh, minister doesn't have to. There's been an ask for an intervention from the minister. Sure. I guess it's safe to say that the honourable member on the floor wouldn't lie about something I said <laughs> to him right in front of me, so he is correct. And all these bills get enacted through um, an order in council, so it'll go to cabinet at some point, <clears throat> um, either before Christmas or right after Christmas, and we'll be ready to stand the whole thing up. Charlottetown Belvedere. Great, okay, thank you very much. Charlottetown Brighton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Member, for bringing forward this bill. I think it's uh, it's uh, really important. Uh, I'm not personally uh, an expert in water either, but very interested and. Even worse, I missed the briefing, which I'm sorry about. But I was wondering what you mean when you when you say I, I know what uh, Kali is, which is I believe what they test for in the lab. When you say uh, uh, water chemistry, are you implying that you're testing for that as well? And what do you mean by that? There's a wide variety of water chemistry testing. Um, thank you, member, for that. So basically what happens now, there's two tests that you can uh, bring, send in for sampling. One is done on bacteria and E. coli, and another separate test is done on um, the chemistry of your, of your drinking water. And what they test in that chemistry is listed in the bill. So I wanted to ensure that whatever they tested was, was written, down, written down so that we knew exactly what was being tested and is what is also um, on the um, department's web page when they talk about the testing process of drinking water. Charles Hambright. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering currently how many, how many wells are tested every year. Uh, I know you have to test, for instance, if you have an Airbnb operation. Um, and how many wells are there, which is likely the volume you're going to get uh, if it's free? Uh, do you have those numbers? I don't, Member. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, I do not have those numbers. Um, you know, these small tourist establishments will be included into this, into this um, bill because, um, uh, you know, we have to do everything we can to support them too. But it is a very good question. But I, I, I just believe that every, every home deserves, every, everybody who drinks portable, uh, potable water here on Prince Edward Island should have that assurance that what they're drinking is safe um, and, is, and is clean. So if we can remove those barriers um, and provide that service, um, that's, that was my main concern in pushing this bill forward. Charles Hunt Brighton. Oh, thank you. Uh, that sounds great. I completely agree with your need. I just uh, was worried that there might be a backup at the lab uh, once it's free. I, I haven't tested my own well in the country for 40 years for cost reasons, or well, maybe I'm just lazy. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Leader of the third party. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Honourable Member, for bringing this bill forward. And as you indicated, everybody on PEI deserves to know they're drinking clean water. And I commend you for this. This is another uh, tool as I'll say to uh, ensure seniors remain in their homes, and it may not seem like a lot of money, but it is an, an added expense. And I know one test is a little less, not as expensive as the second mm -hmm. test, but overall, I think it could cost you $150, $200 for water tests, approximately. A bit lower, but yes. Lower than yeah. that yeah. For, for both yeah. tests? Yes, for, yes, for both. Okay. Yeah, for both. But you're close. But thank you very much for making this forward, and I certainly support your bill. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Question? Uh, Moral Dona? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Member, for uh, the bill and for the previous questions. When you uh, spoke to the Department, did they, did they have any concerns about any bodies or groups of people uh, taking advantage of, of this? I, I, and I don't have, like, uh, the form in front of me that you, you fill out 
uh, to get a water test. Yep. Um, but, you know, for the lack of a, a better phrase, is there, is there any way to, like, do you have to fill out your address? You know, uh, I get it. It looks like it's not just homes. It could be any yep. any well that's not mm -hmm. on municipal water, I guess, that, that is for drinking water. How do you prove it's for drinking water? Like, all that kind of thing. Was there any concerns from the department? Was someone taking yeah. advantage of that? Um, thank you for the question, uh, member. Um, there, I didn't, there was no indication of any concerns uh, that any group would take advantage of this. Um, it is my, I guess, pleasure that every Islander would take advantage of this. Um, you know, again, and goes, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but to ensure that the water that they are drinking and that their family is drinking is, is clean and safe. So basically, um, the amendment that we put in here was to owners of wells that are not part of a municipal water system. So yes, the, the way it works now, you can apply, but if the test comes back, whether you have a problem with your chemistry or uh, E. coli or coliform, you are um, um, contacted by the department and you're asked to, depending on what the situation may be, to um, either flush your system or what have you, and get two clear samples again, which are done at this time free until you have two consecutive clear samples. So that's the process, but there has been no concern shared um, by the department staff about anyone um, taking um, advantage of this. Ronald Dolan. Thank you, Chair. And you said about uh, you know those that are in the municipality or on, on municipal water yep. uh, pay taxes for that kind of testing. There's those that are in municipality that pay taxes for the testing but still use their own well, and I, I'm pretty sure the language of this still allows those people to still get even though they're paying the taxes, it's because they have their own well is, yep. The, yep. is the key. Um, exactly, because it, it, what it does say here is that owners of wells that are not part of a municipal water supply system. Merle Dona. Thank you, Chair. And there, you had mentioned two types of water testing. Is that the only type of, of drinking water testing we do in MPI? They can do other testing for specific times on, um, they can do one on pesticides, let's say, but it's very, um, it's, it's, it's one that's, how would I say, I, I did ask about it, but it's really, it's, it's a lot more um, involved than what this testing is, and a lot more depending on the region and the area, but to determine whether or not pesticides are in your water system, it's like, um, um, again, again I'm, not, I'm not the expert on this, but it's a lot more, a lot more work involved to get that done. And uh, I know a few years ago they did one on nitrates, um, especially in the, uh, the potato belt, I'll call it, region. This was back 10, 11 years ago, and they were doing free nitrate testing at that time, which was uh, a very good call, but nitrates are also included, and I wanted to make sure it was, it was included in uh, this sample too. Uh, uh, thank you, Chuck. That would be my concern if, mm -hmm. if there was, you know, if you weren't concerned about these two tests, but there's mm -hmm. in, and I, this is just my ignorance, I, I don't know if there's, you say, do you think there's one other test that they do? Uh, there, there can be, My concern be, was about yep. that for my drinking mm -hmm. water, and mm -hmm. it was in a specific area. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, we've decided that that's not going to be covered. We just want these two, and if it's up, up yes. over and above these two, you pay for it. Yes. It's my understanding, member, that, that actually the department already does testing on those areas. Um, I don't know if, for sure if it's sporadic or if they have specific areas that they continually monitor um, for, for pesticides and water. Morel Donna. I'm good. Thanks, Chair. Minister of Land, uh, Agriculture and Land Justice, Public Safety, and the Attorney General. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question to clarify. Is this for residential Wells, or is this also commercial wells for pre-testing? I'm, I'm using a, I want to use an example. My previous life as a dairy farmer, mm -hmm. as a standards uh, that you have to test your water on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Is this included? Would a firm be included in this? So what it does include is, and, and I'll, just, I'll just repeat the story again, uh, to owners of wells that are not part of a municipal water system or industrial water supply system. So it's tied to a well, not necessarily a household. It's tied to a well. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's all. Are there any other questions? Oh, uh, Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. 
really appreciate you bringing this bill, okay. this bill forward, member. And uh, I see it's quite a comprehensive list of chemicals that can be tested here, and I appreciate that. And representing, as I do, a rural area, not uncommon for me, like you, as you explained in your preamble, that you, you get calls from constituents mm -hmm. concerned, concerned about their water quality. And so now, um, rural residents, and I realize they're not just rural residents, mm -hmm. but predominantly yeah. this will be useful to rural residents, will be able to determine whether their water is potable or not, safe to drink. And this is not, I realize this is outside the scope of your bill, but I'm wondering if you could, uh, if you know and could explain to the House, if you get a test back, for example, and you use nitrates a little, mm -hmm. uh, a few minutes ago, if the nitrate level is above what is considered to be safe, 10 milligrams per mm -hmm. litre, I think it is for nitrates, yeah. um, I'm assuming that this bill would not provide any provision to to remedy that, but what what ha what happens when that comes back, and who's responsible for dealing with an, an issue like that? So, so presently, you pay for your um, water testing. You send your sample in, and if something comes back an issue, um, something that doesn't meet or is below the standard, uh, what is recommended, um, they will contact you, and they will ask. So they will give you um, some direction on how to remedy it. And following that, they will do free um, retests until you have two consecutive tests that come back clear. Or I shouldn't say clear, but within within the parameters. Right. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. And for E. coli, I understand that you you know you can shock the well, and that's not a terribly expensive process. Mm -hmm. And and typically that will solve the issue. Yeah. You get two clear tests, you're good to go. Exactly. But for something like nitrates, they tend they tend mm -hmm. to be very persistent and and long-standing. So. Yeah. In a situation like that, is it always the response the financial economic responsibility of the homeowner to remediate that problem, or is there ever any government help, or how do you solve that? Um, that's a very good question, and nitrates can leach, you know, for for 20 years or more at times. Um, but I, I did not pose that question because I, this one basically is. It's not about what happens afterwards, it's about that first step in providing access to free drinking water so that people will be notified if they have that problem, they're aware of that, that problem. What happens afterwards, I'm not sure, but that's something that we can advocate for at that time. <laughs> Leader of the opposition. I'm good, I, I appreciate your yeah. answer, thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I don't have a question, I just had a general comment mm -hmm. that I wanted to say to the promoter. I've had. So many people reach out to me on this issue. It's incredibly important. I know that uh, for people who live in rural parts of the province who don't have municipal water supply, mm -hmm. um, the cost associated with having your well tested is very prohibitive. And it's been uh, noted on a number of occasions how important this is. So I just wanted to say that I'm very supportive of this and I'm glad you're bringing it forward. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? All right, I will ask the question, uh, shall, the, uh, shall the bill carry? Yeah. Perfect. For order. Thank Congrats you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. the title? Uh, an Act to Amend the Water Act. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. Being enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry? As Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled an Act to Amend the Water Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same with amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Carry.
Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I call motion number 49 to the floor. Shall I carry? Uh, Mr. Speaker, motion 49 was under debate, and debate was adjourned by the mo mover, the Honorable Member from O'Leary and Vernesse. The Honorable Member from O'Leary and Vernesse, third party whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And like I said, this is a, a subject that uh, I've had a fair bit to say on already. And, it, and I think we've seen more and more some of the things that I've talked about have come to light in the media recently. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the RNs uh, put out a uh, YouTube video that, uh, that really highlighted the frustration and the challenge that they are, they are having. Uh, you've seen questions in the legislature since that time that we've found out information that has been rather uh, disappointing maybe, shocking. Uh, there's different ways we could probably describe it when it comes to some of the issues around long-term care in this province. We've uh, been uh, chasing issues from medical homes and how they actually will resolve problems to medical schools, to paramedic problems, to contracts. It, uh, but it really boils down to the issue that we haven't been able to find a situation where we can get the staffing into the, our health care facilities to deliver the services that Islanders expect. And not only what Islanders expect, Mr. Speaker, but the standards that our, our health care system implements, whether that's through our accreditation process, whether that's through uh, issues around the, the Canada Health Act, whether it's issues around uh, protocols and standards that, uh, that the professions implement themselves, Mr. Speaker. And uh, when you get the situation that uh, these health care professionals are reaching out and saying that the, you know, the Prince Edward Home, who's a 24 people, call in sick on a weekend, Mr. Speaker, that tells you there's chronic major problems in our health care system. And, uh, you know, I, you know, today I, I asked questions to the Minister of Health regarding our issues around where magically did he find the health care workers to open 21 beds. There was 42 beds in this province that were sitting empty, nobody in them. And the reason what I'm hearing was it was, it was because they didn't have the staff to provide the level of care that those people, uh, uh, to meet the protocols that those people have. And then the Minister makes a statement that the, oh, gonna, next week we're going to have 21 beds open, just magically. I don't know where these people came from, Mr. Speaker, to say that, that, that they're going to solve that. Now, once again, you know, we get lots of feedback from the general public in this. And what do I hear, Mr. Speaker? And I tried to get the minister to give me some assurances that where these people are coming from to fill these positions, which he never did give me an answer to, Mr. Speaker. But we're hearing what we're doing is we're reducing the level of care that everybody's getting in the facility, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, uh, they had uh, a staff member from Health uh, PEI explain some of the issues where, uh, you know, people may have to get a sponge bath instead of an actual bath. They may uh, have to uh, stay in their bed to get food. They may not be able to interact and get, because all of that takes extra work to take of our staff that have to take those people to those spots or provide the hands-on delivery of service. And we can't do it with the staff that we got. So. It just means that you're basically diluting the whole service. Now, what happened, you know, I think that's, a, that's an issue that has happened in other provinces, and the pandemic was uh, shed some pretty bright lights on that. In Ontario, we've seen cases where, you know, the armed forces had to go in and try to uh, uh, find out problems, and some of the information that had come back was pretty shocking on the level of care that was provided. Now, most of those were in uh, private facilities, Mr. Speaker. But now we're, we're in this situation, we're even seeing our own publicly owned operated facilities here, Mr. Speaker. So when, you know, when we hear that an RN had to do a 24-hour shift, you once again know that there's problems. And once again we hear of situations, why, why did that nurse do the 24-hour shift? What were the incentives that were put there? What kind of situations did the department implement to make that happen? They, they, they increased the pay. They, they do whatever enticement that they possibly can to make that happen, Mr. Speaker. But once again, not in a situation where it's a safe protocol. So I'm saying here, Mr. Speaker, that you, you, you didn't do it properly, you didn't do it safely, and I think you've done it all for the case that there happens to be a by-election just around the corner, Mr. Oh. Speaker. 
And those are the types of things that means that you're not following the protocols the, and the safety uh, and putting staff more under duress, more under stress, putting them more in unsafe protocols than ever before, Mr. Speaker. And that's where the problems come. So this government doesn't always follow its own its own uh, backslap and comments where it says, you know, we only follow science, we only follow uh, what the, the experts tell you, but yet decisions like that start to get, get made, Mr. Speaker. And I think that's what I see is where, you know, you're, you're starting to see where staff just get so burnt out from that, the stress, the deterioration and motivation that they have when they don't feel confident that the leadership in this province is providing them, uh, the, you know, guidance out of this predicament that we're in, Mr. Speaker. And I hear it lots of times that, you know, everybody say, well, we're in a pandemic. Yeah, I, I get that there's some issues around pandemics. But it's, that, that doesn't even, it's not even scratching the surface of the core problems that we've had in the last number of years of uh, uh, trying to deliver health care in this province, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, I get thrown back, oh, well, when you were there, it wasn't so good. No, I'm, I get that. It wasn't great then either. But it's gotten far worse, Mr. Speaker, and I think just about everybody in the health care system will tell you that. That's not something I'm trying to, you know, uh, make up here or anything. And we hear the other thing, well, it's, you know, every other place is having trouble with recruiting. And I remember when I was Minister of Health, uh, uh, four or five years back now, I guess, when you start looking at it, um, you know, the amount of people in the patient registry was a pretty good example of that. They said there was 8,000 then, not a great number, not proud of that by any means. But today it's 20,000. Well, 20,000 looks pretty good. And then you, all of a sudden you hear Nova Scotia, 70,000 people in the patient registry in Nova Scotia. Well, yeah, okay, it's less numbers. But you don't, you're not even equating into the factor the issue of per capita. Nova Scotia has the 10 times the population that we have, so they'd have to have 200,000 people in the patient registry equal the same predicament that we are in here. That's, that, those are shocking numbers. In Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, they, uh, you know, they, they got so mad over there on their numbers, you know, they threw out the government, and uh, now they're still trying to come up with new ways and new solutions. But here, you know, oh, well, we're doing pretty good compared with them. No, we're not, Mr. Speaker. It's far worse. How about we even get into the issue of uh, nurses, you know, when it comes to some of the numbers that we're dealing with, Mr. Speaker? Uh, I think in Nova Scotia, like here we have about 200 uh, nurse uh, vacancies. That would mean there would have to be uh, 2,000 in Nova Scotia. No, they're, they're only around 1,000. They're not, they're not nearly in this predicament that we're in here, Mr. Speaker, for our numbers of RNs that are, that are uh, uh, of vacant positions that need to be filled. But yes, I get that the, the government understands that it's going to be in the situation where it's competing against every other province out there for some of these uh, positions. You know, that, that, but that's a given. We've always been in that situation, Mr. Speaker. How about paramedics is another one. We see, you know, situations where Island EMS says they can't find the, the people. We've had a paramedic school here in Prince Edward Island for a while, UPEI, still got problems. It really comes to back to the, like the retention, keeping people, keeping them happy, keeping them motivated, not putting them in predicaments that are unsafe, that they can't do their job with properly. You know, these are the types of things that I'm seeing that we have to try to make sure that we're, we're resolving these. And, and we don't seem to see any of that coming from this particular government, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, now I'm hearing, you know, they come out with these medical schools. You know, we got briefed there yesterday, 50 new additional positions for physicians, RNs, uh, uh, nurse practitioners, the list goes on. We have possibly 17 lined up. And, but yet we're going to have them up and operational by, by uh, end of March. And you've got all these other positions that are up. You, could, you know, you've got 700 vacant positions in the health care system. The only thing you're doing is you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're taking somebody from some other position, moving them over to here, and once again, you say, oh, that's solving the problem. It's not. It's, it's like the leader of the opposition said. You're, you're, you're uh, trying to keep a cauldron from overflowing here, but you, you didn't plug the hole at the bottom. You'll never, you'll never solve the problem, Mr. Speaker. Now we hear that some of the people that they're having to get, they're pulling them out of retirement, Mr. Speaker. That's great. You're pulling people out of retirement to staff medical homes, to staff some of these positions. But that's not, not going to solve your problem into the long term. That's just getting you through a, through a by-election, or it's getting you through the next crisis that you're dealing with in the health care system, Mr. Speaker. So these are the types of things that I think that we have to deal with here. We've got to stop this here uh, charade 
playing the smoke and mirrors, trying to change that we're solving all the problems, when, when everybody knows in the system, everybody knows in Prince Edward Island that these solutions aren't being resolved. We're not seeing it get any better, only seeing it get worse. It continues on and on and on. And there's an old saying out there, Mr. Speaker, if you kind of, I would say, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. And that's what we're dealing with here, Mr. Speaker. It ain't going to happen, Mr. Speaker. It isn't. So we need to uh, get serious about this, stop, uh, stop playing the games, let's get our uh, staff uh, hired, get them retained, get them working properly, and at least provide a level of service that uh, we can provide safely and, and meet the standards that we're trying to, uh, trying to address here, Mr. Speaker. So, so with that, I am moving this uh, motion, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to hearing some of the comments that our uh, seconder might have on this and uh, as we debate this on the floor of the legislature, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and third party House Leader. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm happy to to second this motion, and it's it's a difficult one, obviously, um, be, because it's it's so real, and I think it hits it hits all of us, and and we're we're not in a great place right now. We're not supporting the people that support other people, and the nurses and the the doctors, they're the people that do not complain about this stuff, and now we're having them complain, and that's very scary. I read I read an email. Um, they came to me and it was very disturbing because I could feel the pain and hardship in this nurse's email that she wrote. And it's not, it's not fair for her. She's giving everything that she has and they're giving everything they have for other people. And the system and the leadership is, is breaking down. When you look at this motion, you see words like um, dangerous occurrences for both residents and staff members, workload, work-life balance, okay, um, double shifts, for healthcare workers, overtime for healthcare workers. These these are these are difficult things. One of those and alone is is enough. Now we're talking about all three, and that's what's happening. And we've got to do better at supporting them. And I mean, I do have ideas. I think we all have ideas, but we're not going to get there with with just saying we're going to recruit people. It's about retention at this point. It's about valuing the people that are working. It's about finding a way to do that. And and this province can't stop right now and you can't do enough to make sure that happens because I think an entire province is stressed about where we are and where we're going through this winter. You look at, you look at uh, the 31 vacancies at the Prince Edward home, 31. Just recently you find the Sherwood home closes, okay, and then we're, 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 we're taking those people, where do they end up? At, at, at the Prince Edward home which the staff there will open, openly accept them with open arms and find a place with them and they'll do their darndest. But then you find out three or four weeks later <laughs> that uh, you read in the paper that there's problems with staffing um, at, at, at PE home. Okay, 14 beds closed, nine residents moved. Those are nine, nine beds that have come out of the system and, and stressed out an already stressed and taxed area. Um, just, just, just for one example, and those are all kinds of different people in there working and trying to make that, that survive. And it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult situation when a survey by the Department of Health shows that nurses are 45% asked, uh, th they're indicating a toxic environment. <clears throat> and, and what does that mean? A toxic environment that they have to go to. It, it creates burnout, stress, and unworkable conditions. At this time, this time I'll adjourn debate. <laughs> uh, seconder by the leader of the third party. Troy Carey. Carey. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the first order of the day be now read. Sean Carey. Order number one, consideration of the capital estimates in committee. Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that this House do now resolve itself under Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Sean Carey. Carey, The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
House to consider the grant of capital supply to Her Majesty. The request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Yes. Honourable Members, while we're waiting for our, our guest uh, to arrive, um, we are on page 25, Capital Expenditure for Transportation and Infrastructure. We are under the section Capital Improvements Highways. This section has been read and it is currently under uh, discussion. Okay, um, Minister. Uh, I have, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, answers to some questions that were posed uh, from uh, members of the House. And uh, if we can table them and make copies, that would Absolutely. Be great. So yeah. we'll have those copied and distributed uh, to the members. Um, witness, would you please provide us with your name and title for answer? Gordon McFadgen, Assistant Secretary of Treasury Board. Thank you very much and welcome. So again, honourable members, we are on page 25, Transportation and Infrastructure, under the section Capital Improvements, Highways. Charlotte Ham Brighton. Thank you, Chair. I was wondering if you'd permit me to ask a couple of questions on land. Uh, when we were in that section, I had a personal breakdown on my computer, so I missed asking them. Would you like to go back to land or...? or sure, you, that's fine, I guess. Yeah. Sure, member, if you want to go. So, as I understand it, these land purchases uh, are often for future projects the government may undertake. Can you describe uh, how you decide where to buy land and what purposes you buy land for? Um, well, Honourable Member, I, I, I'm not sure that I can answer that fully, but I would guess that it would be maybe for projects. It could be, um, I know there's been land purchased um, through a you know tax sale. It's been given back to the to the to the department um, in lieu of unpaid property tax. Um, I, I think, you know, if someone approached government um, through transportation, if they were interested in selling, that could be an option. Uh, so I think there are various reasons, but uh, Gord, do you have any, anything uh, sure. else? I, just, just, I guess, to, to add what the minister was providing there. Um, so the budget for um, within this section, within land, would be only for um, land to be acquired towards government's target um, to meeting the 7% target. So if there were land required as part of a capital project, let's say a roadway or we needed another uh, piece of property for, a, um, for an active transportation lane, they would kind of go and talk to the various landowners. Um, if they were doing a roundabout, they have to get pieces of land in front of, and that would be with the capital project. So. The budget here is just to purchase land related to protecting land uh, on behalf of the province. Charlotte and Brighton. So I understand that uh, that the goal is to to reach uh, seventy percent, uh, but I understand that's that's only uh, we are only at four point four percent currently. So when I mean, the difference in between the two numbers is approximately uh, thirty thousand acres, by my figuring. Uh, how do you um, hope to get there? What's the plan? That seems like the uh, the five hundred ninety thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. You know, is a nice amount, but uh, it doesn't sound like it's substantial enough. Sure. Um, I, I guess what I would say, land, as you're aware, is a, a very valuable commodity, and, and a lot of it is in the hands of private landholders. So where private landholders approach government um, or where there are, in, in the case of the buffer zone program, where there's areas that are um, sort of identified as high-risk areas, we would be going out to talk to landowners, but generally um, we're not trying to push people off their land. If land becomes available, we have a budget to buy the land that becomes available um, when, when circumstances change. Charlotte and Brighton. So, in your 2021 throne speech, you had a 10% target. Uh, how is that going to fit? Uh, when do you uh, plan to reach that target, and how how will you get it if you're kind of only waiting for people to show up at your door, if you will? Um, I, I'm not really uh, sure I can answer that question either, Honourable Member. It's uh, a target that we put in place and we'll work um, across government departments. You know, there are various ways, as I mentioned earlier, to acquire land and we'll continue, uh, you know, on that path and um, 
you know, I know there could be more money in the budget. There could be more money in every department in the budget, and we have to decide <coughs> fiscally where we're going to spend that. Um, and so that is the target amount for for the coming year. Charlottetown Brighton. So, uh, do you have any idea, kind of based on past experience, how many acres uh, you would get for the uh, five hundred and ninety thousand? Uh, that is, if there are opportunities to buy. Um, that's really dependent on what properties become available. There are, you know, we've gotten properties in kind of wetland areas, which which are great. We we protect those. Um, so obviously the value of those are less, um, um, but there's no one. We, we do an appraisal process on each property and, and, and pay a, a fair market to the to the appraiser to the person that is selling. Um, so it's really hard to determine how far we'll get with this. But um, as property becomes available, um, I don't think I've ever seen any purchase ever turned down that somebody has come by to government, unless of course you can't get at the price. But um, it's. Um, you know, we're open, I guess, for business, as the minister said, to anybody that wants to come forward and sell some land. Charlottetown Brighton. So uh, I understand things are unpredictable, both in terms of office and price, but if you look back in the past, like, what's what's the most acres you ever bought in the year? So, or what's the average? Uh, yeah, um, we don't have that in front of us, honorable member, but we will bring it back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlottetown Brighton, I'm just going to, since this section was already carried, I'm just going to give you one yes, more question. Yes, don't, don't want, one okay, more question. I'm actually okay. okay. Let's go back to, okay. uh, are you done? Where you, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, so next uh, on my list for capital improvements highway section is Mermaid Stratford. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a couple questions and I don't know if it necessarily falls under highway, but it's a collector, the Bunbury Road, it's a collector of everybody who travels that way to the bridge. <clears throat> um, that's also the section of road where there'll be an access point to the community campus um, where the new high school would be going in. And I'm just wondering if there is um, money in this capital budget in order to look at the traffic component of that additional build and um, when that work will start. Uh, <clears throat> there's nothing to look at the component of that. Uh, I think that would be through operations if they're going to do a study, maybe. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, we're not there yet for sure, and there's nothing in here that, that uh, indicates that. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So uh, if this is something that's going to be going in for next year, just because I believe the school construction is starting, this is 2021, 2022 is the construction? No, 2023. So the highway improvements would actually have to be done before the construction can start. So at what point in time does that actually begin? Because. I mean, it has to be part of the planning, right? We have to be able to access the uh, the school. No, my stranger yeah, has. No, for yeah, sure. I, I'm sorry. I just didn't quite understand nope, the fine. context of the question. Um, as part of any capital project in this being building of a school, um, the, the the engineers involved that would be part of the building would be working with the other side of their department. That's the uh, the um, transportation or the roadside to make sure that the traffic plan for the area is looked after prior to um, any introducing new traffic to an area. So that would be part of the capital, not the capital of the school project, but it will be looked after for sure. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And do you have any information on the, the, that in your notes, in your big binder there? No. No, we, um, no, I don't know, you know, how, like, is there going to be a roundabout there that They'll have an assessment of how many cars they expect for the school part. What the complicating factor is, obviously, this is a very large parcel of property, of which the municipality, or Stratford in this case, would have to do their work and work with the province as to what else is going on that to make sure that there's a, an adequate uh, flow and access for that particular site off the highway. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. It's just a, it's an interesting area, right, because it, that would have been... Bunbury. It would have been a kind of like a rural municipality that was then brought into Stratford, and with the growth, and especially with the sprawl out into the Mermaid, Fort Augustus, all that area, um, traffic has certainly picked up. And and I mean, understanding the requirements of how many kids would be attending, we're talking at least 750 kids attending that school, and then 
the other, it's not a big road. It is really looks like almost a subdivision road with sidewalks, right? So anyway, I would just say that um, I'm interested in seeing how the province is going to manage that traffic and the constitu my constituents in that area are definitely interested in what's going to happen in that particular area um, of Stratford because no doubt it's going to have some impact. So anyway, I would like to, obviously it must be in the numbers here somewhere, I would just love to have known when that spending would happen so that we'll know when there's going to be more information available to the, my constituents. <clears throat> Thank you, Honourable Member. I'm sure that the department's listening and uh, they'll bring back what they have, at least some timeline around that. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, <clears throat> Chair. You're welcome. Leader of the Opposition. Thank Chair. I just want to go, I don't, don't want to go back to the section, Chair, but uh, there was some discussion about appropriation of land a minute ago, and I know that appropriation and expropriation of land is sometimes necessary for highway projects, and I'm, I'm wondering where would that fit in the section we just discussed, or would that be here in capital improvements? Um, it would definitely be in capital improvements if we're acquiring land for a road project. Right. Leader of the Opposition. So that, but that's not broken out here at all, eh? is, is that because that's a sort of unknown entity when we're entering any construction year? Um, for sure, uh, depending on where, where the construction's happening, um, they're always looking to make sure they have um, an adequate right-of-way. And if, say, they use the best uh, the roundabouts going out St. Peter's Road, so the amount of land that we had within the right-of-way was not sufficient to construct the, the roundabout, so they had to go to kind of the landowners on each one of those sides and kind of negotiate with them. So um, expropriation is kind of the last kind of ditch effort that if we can't get a deal, uh, I, the, the department's very good at negotiating all kinds of creative arrangements so that um, people are kind of happy when they're losing their property. <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. That's an interesting turn of phrase. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> <lose property. laughs> uh, there, yeah, yeah I, I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, so can we just, just for my own benefit here, uh, and it's been a while since I've done any reading on this, but I, you mentioned that expropriation is the last resort and you hope that you can, you, you can either do it in another way or if you do have to expropriate land that the process is amicable and you come to a, an agreement at the end. But if you aren't able to do that amicably, what, what, what is the process if you can't come to an agreement? I, I don't have the process in front of me for sure. I don't know sure. if you can... Definitely they would be relying on professional appraisers to give independent opinions on that. Um, because as with any negotiation, what I believe is fair and you believe is fair sometimes are quite, uh, quite opposed. So we would be relying on uh, an independent third party appraiser to kind of drive a, a range of value. Leader of the Opposition. And again, assuming that we have uh, differing opinions from differing uh, appraisers on the value of land, and you still cannot come to an agreement, is there a mediation process that, or where is that final decision made and how? Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of a mediation process per se, and we may have to go to expropriation as the next step if it's deemed to be required for, for the purposes of, of the project. But I can determine, I can find out for you whether they go to a mediation. Um, I think they try not to have like a government appraiser versus they, they end up with, we would contract with a, a mm -hmm. professional outside of government so that they get a fair opinion of, of what the value is based on appraisal standards. Leader of the Opposition. And again, excuse my ignorance, but does, it, does that end up in the judicial branch in order to resolve that, or is it...? Uh, that, I, I don't have information on that. Okay, uh, that's fine. Leader um, of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on this section, and um, I'm really pleased as I drive into town to be stopped every morning now in New Haven to, <laughs> at the construction that's going on there, and uh, I know that's going to be a fairly large project. Uh, the so we know, as a rural MLA, one meets with the department every year and you come forward with your list of wishes and, and, and those are met or not met to varying degrees. We have a very specific number here for national collector highways and provincial paving. Um, the, the number that's there, um, 
How is that distributed amongst the districts across the, the province? Yeah, uh, we do not have that in front of us, uh, Honorable Member. I, um, I know myself, I, I look to my road supervisors to, 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 to let me know where the roads are the worst. They seem to know better than, than myself, although, you know, we, we do make a, a list. So uh, I can't really comment on how many roads get done and how many kilometers in each district. So if something, we'll make a note and bring back what we can. Leader of the Opposition. Okay, I, I mean, I ask because, of course, I live in District 17 and represent that district, but I drive the roads of the entire province, and it's that's true for, for all of us. We, we drive in roads outside our district, as do our constituents. And so it seems um, very important to me that we have a consistent level of quality of roads from tip to tip, and that that doesn't vary drastically. And I understand there will be, you know, depending on the Tra the traffic on any particular road. So there, there, that um, prioritization, if I can put it that way, of roads is that something that's made by the experts in the department. Is that what you're saying, Minister? It's, it's not made by myself for my own district, so I'm guessing it's not made. Yeah, and uh, the stranger can speak to that. I just have a couple of notes because I kind of sure. asked no, some, I appreciate some that, of that Gordon. question. Um, so, um, Every year, well, obviously, you know, you know, pavement deteriorates at different rates in different areas of the province, depending on the severity of the winter and the spring kind of freeze-thaw cycle and the amount of traffic and volume, particularly truck volume, on any particular road. Um, so the Department of Highway Maintenance Division, um, they're kind of reviewing, based as the Minister said, with their road supervisors and county superintendents in the spring of the year they'll make an initial assessment on how roads have wintered um, and kind of get a priority ranking would be looking at what the kind of local kind of conditions for cost per kilometer are likely to be based on price of uh, well price of crude and, and, and those aggregate commodities um, and then they'd kind of go down to how far they can with the budget available how many roads based on condition and they'd be starting with uh, the worst obviously and, and kind of getting through the list. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So I, I noticed that um, we've been consistently overspending on bridges um, almost every year for, for quite a while now. <coughs> and um, I'm wondering whether the increased budget over the next few years um, includes a flexible amount to Sort of anticipate that, <laughs> and, and and I'm wondering what the reasons are that bridges are consistently being like quite considerably over budgeted, under budgeted. Excuse me. Uh, I, I know there is quite a list of bridges that are no longer you know in commission or you know like the roads are blocked because they're you know smaller bridges. I, I, you yeah. know I've had uh, one replaced in my district. But there's still one that that is not. Working and has you know you haven't been able to use that word for a long time, um, so I I don't know there is quite a number though that I know are out of commission and and are not used and as you well know we have a lot of roads on PEI, a lot of bridges and you know how do you choose the priorities that are there? Um, yeah, I don't know. Can you add anything to that? Um, yeah, so just I guess for the record um, the, again there's a whole um, division, a bridge division within the department. Um, and they're uh, responsible for conducting annual inspections. So starting some time ago, as back as far as 2008, they started an inspection process. Um, they, um, within the last two or three years, they've done inspections on over 1,000 bridges, which is about 70% of the total. There's, um, I think, almost 300 large structures, and then, as the minister had indicated, uh, seven over 750 small structures would be like a culvert almost going over the road, um, and the, and the budget is, is planned out based on uh, they have a, a bridge index that would rate them good, um, right down to fair and, and poor. Um, so between that and the amount of traffic that goes over them, um, they're they're coming up with a list on when things need to get kind of update, upgraded and, and repaired. Um, they would always have um, a budget available as well for emergency or they would be required on an emergency basis to do 
um, repairs where you know sufficient traffic or uh, an appropriate detour can't be can't be held. But um, this is definitely again one of the areas where um, we can access the Build Canada fund and we can. When the projects are on the go, if we, we can get them through, we'll, we'll get the work done type of thing. But um, over the kind of last two building summers with, with COVID on the go, I think a real push has been to try to get at some of these bridges to accelerate the program a little bit to keep the economy moving and keep the work going. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So uh, I, I appreciate that there is a long list of bridges with varying degrees of deterioration across the province here. And I'm wondering whether that 10 million that's there, and again, we've consistently overspent considerably over the last little while, but um, is that already fully allocated? And, and if that's the case, and we have more spending out, out, either out of choice or necessity, uh, would that inevitably come from a special warrant? Yep, um, for sure. Um, if I think, the, I think the bridge is planned, and I asked for that as well, there's, there's three pretty significant bridges plan for next year. Um, the Bayview Bridge, Little Harbour, and the carryover the Morel Bridge replacement. The Morel Bridge was a right. fairly major. Yeah. Um, so that's the three that they're going to be working on um, over the next the next fiscal year. Um, if there were, and that they should consume that budget. If there were emergency repairs that could come up, or if the costs on these planned projects were more than kind of anticipated, they would definitely have to come back. If the overall budget for the department was going to be over. So they can kind of maneuver a little bit within the paving and the bridges and the total budget available to to the department um, before coming for a special warrant. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So if we look at the National Collector Highways uh, and, and total up those figures, it's, about, it's just a little over $66 million, um, between last year and the or, or this current fiscal year, rather, and, and next year. So how, how much of that money for national and collector highways is coming from the federal government? What percentage? Yeah, it's not exactly 50-50, because, again, not all the costs are eligible for cost sharing, but it's very close to 50-50. Um, there is, like, land purchases don't qualify. Some up front and some administration don't qualify for sharing, but um, pretty close to 50-50. Right. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So about 33 million, uh, again, approximately yeah. provincial and 33 federal. So how much of that money, and I realize the provincial portion, um, all of that could have been spent on something else, except we can't then leverage the funds from the feds. But how much of that 33 million from the feds, if we hadn't spent it on roads, could we have spent on something else? Should we have chosen to do so? <clears throat> You mean through a different program? No, if, if it came through certain programs, was there flexibility within those programs to allocate the funds for something other than road building? No, there was no. not. You actually, we have to actually apply to Ottawa for projects that qualify under the Build Canada and the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. And once they're approved under the various programs, then that's sort of the work that has to get done. The revenue that comes from that actually goes to the operating budget that gets can get spent on because revenue goes in as revenue and then departments get expenditure budgets against the revenue to get right. to the overall deficit right. or surplus. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So, I mean, that's a $66 million over a couple of years, half of that being provincial money is a significant amount. And as we've said in this House before, we, we've all described the housing situation as a crisis. We have described the health situation as a crisis. So I'm wondering if you've ever consider dropping the roads budget because as far as I'm aware there is no paving crisis here in the province um, considering dropping that roads budget and redirecting those provincial funds understanding that there's leveraging <coughs> issues here as well to deal with those crises in housing and health um, well honorable member uh, first of all uh, if you drive the island, you know that there are still lots of roads that, that need work. And I understand they, that. they do get to a point where they can't be repaired anymore or recapped. They need, you know, need to be redone totally. Um, we, you know, we talk about housing and the ability for government to actually 
how much can we build? You know, how much can we actually build in a year and how many can we complete? And I think that's part of the challenge. We know that construction has been booming and actually to, to, to have uh, contractors bid on new projects, um, you know, that that puts us in a in a position where we're, we're probably going to spend more and uh, we're also taking uh, those construction companies away from, from private developers or, 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 you know, the general public that, that want to build. So, uh, you know, there, there's more, it's more than just money. It's, it's the fact that you need to have someone who, you need to have contractors that can do the work. And, and we know we've been in a construction boom and continue to be. So, you, you know, we have to look at how many dollars we actually really think that we could spend for housing within a, within a year time frame. So that would be part of the Leader of the opposition. Yeah, and again, Minister, I, I appreciate that there are several pinch points here, potential pinch points anyway, that, that would restrict what the province can do. But of course, not all housing is, necess is necessary to be a new build. We have a, a, you know, a fair amount of building um, inventory particularly in the capital region, owned by the government, that could be converted into housing, um, clearly would still require work, but it's not necessarily a new build. Uh, how much thought has gone into renovations to create new housing, renovations on publicly owned buildings, and again, not necessarily in, in the CADC area, but, but a lot of it could be, um, in order to help alleviate the housing crisis? Yeah, I'm not sure if you have a particular, like we don't have a number of empty buildings that have nothing in them, but um, but I know the department is looking at all scenarios, when I say the department, the Department of Social Development and Housing, um, all scenarios. So if there was an opportunity to, um, the Smith Lodge was one of them, that there were an opportunity had come up to um, acquire a property that it was in the private sector hands and it's now it's a government owned building that uh, they can do something with, um, I guess we have the curling club now that potentially could be turned into something at some point, although it's a, it's a big cavern of a building for sure. Mm. Um, and just, so I think they're looking at all the options. Um, and I just wanted to chip in one other, uh, one other point there that I had looked at this sort of analysis of the Department of Transportation versus other departments. And in the year over year, um, so the last five year budget, um, Transportation was about 30.5% of the total allocated capital budget. This year they're at about 28.7, so it's gone down. Um, the social development housing last year was at 5.5, and now they're at 8. So they've, mm -hmm. they've grown in this five year capital envelope. So just yeah. that out. Leader of the Opposition. And I, I appreciate you bringing those stats, and that is good. That's good news. Um, one final thing on, on this, and, and again, I realize I'm straying a little bit away from the, but I appreciate your leniency here, Chair. Um, one possible way that we could acquire or come about those that empty space here in government-owned buildings or publicly-owned buildings would be to carry through with that goal of having 30% of civil servants working from home. Um, that would clearly open up office space here, again, specifically and probably predominantly here in Charlottetown, but not necessarily entirely in Charlottetown. Um, what are, how far are we along in that goal of getting 30% of public servants to work from home so that we don't need all of this office space for offices and could potentially use it as housing? Across all departments, I'm not sure. Um, something we'll bring back, but again, uh, <laughs> Many of the government buildings have been fairly overcrowded too, you know. So we we need do need some of that space. And I know we are adapting. Um, is it um, the Jones or the which one Sullivan? Sullivan. 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 We're adapting part of the Sullivan so that there can be that you know come to work two days a week and and rotate in and out of you know a, a workspace. So you're not actually you don't still have your own desk in your own cubicle. You're you're sharing with other people. So there is some modification happening at Sullivan that's part of uh, the budgeting that we're doing and uh, to help with that, you know, uh, working from home part time. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. And I, I appreciate you staying on this and allowing me as much time. And I, I, did, I, I will cede the floor now, but I just wanted to say I think 
there are opportunities here for government to be creative if we are bold and visionary in how we can get around the various restrictions that are, are currently in place for providing housing for islanders. And I would encourage government to do everything it can and, and not leave any stone unturned in looking for opportunities. Thank you. Charlotte Ann Broughton. Yeah. Uh, just, just a question uh, regarding some comments. Uh, just made. I understand that that the uh, department has to apply for federal funding, uh, but that was not really the question. Is what kind of options do you have to apply for? Are there any others project types than highways? I mean, forgetting about whether it's a good or bad thing. Uh, you know, obviously you're doing a good job with highways. Um, I, I'd have to bring back the specific criteria that we're eligible. If there's, whether it's the Build Canada Fund or the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Plan, they have specific criteria that uh, the department would be reviewing to uh, kind of put up what is available for uh, for for us to utilize. Um, so I think they've gone through the inventory of, of what is could be done within this capital budget and pushed up projects against that, uh, those, those envelopes that, that, that fit the criteria that Ottawa sets. Charlotte Ann Brighton. Uh, I don't have that document in front of me, but I did have it at some point, and it seems to me there was a m much wider range of projects than, uh, and I can't remember if housing was involved or not, maybe not, but it wasn't just paving roads. Anyway, I would like to uh, ask some questions on uh, active uh, transportation and I want to start by saying that I think it's just tremendous how, how much work has been done already. So uh, um, anyway, I still have a few questions like uh, why does the fund drop uh, about one million in the, uh, in the future years? Uh, why are you not keeping up the good work? Um. And I, and I think I answered this question the last time we were here. The Invest in Canada Infrastructure Program opened up an availability for this particular work to be carried out on a, on a say, a one-time basis, but it wasn't in the original criteria. Mm -hmm. So when this opportunity came up during the year, um, the department applied and was able to, uh, to get some more projects approved through it to get some cost-shared funding where, in the past, this would have been just a provincial initiative only. Charlotte Ann Brighton. Well, thank you. Um, in the past, uh, some of the active transportation have been using money collected from uh, the carbon tax, I believe. Will future funding be depending on carbon taxes as well? Um, so there's the active transportation has two lenses, one through the operating budget where um, a community group or a municipality could apply to government to do an active transportation corridor and there's been a number of projects funded where we don't own the asset. Um, for this part of the budget, these would be on in close to provincial roadways or trails that, that are owned by the province. So we do the work under here and we own and, and upkeep them. So it's um, the levy was kind of pushed up as this could be one of the activities against uh, what we're collecting the levy for, but um, uh, on this capital side, um, it, it, it's things that we own for sure. Charlotte Ann Brighton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the COVID Resilience Fund, is that a fund that uh, gets applied for in uh, active? Does uh, that apply to active <coughs> transportation or is that no, something else? That was, a se that was a separate funding for repair and upgrading of schools, hospitals, and government mm -hmm. buildings. Charlotte Town Brighton. So you are spending a fair bit of money on uh, paving shoulders, and I guess it would typically be, a lot of it would be done as you're paving the whole roadway anyway, and maybe others are separate projects. Uh, do you have any idea what percentage of the paving dollars go towards the, that aspect of it? 
I, th I think there's a fair separation between the roadway surface that would be captured in the paving budget and then the active transportation, the shoulder portion. Mm -hmm. So I think they're trying to uh, keep the two uh, requirements a little bit separate. Charles on Brighton. So uh, do you have a commi commitment now when you repave a road to almost include uh, the shoulder to essentially cover all the, uh, all the roads with uh, paved shoulders? I think it would depend on the road, and, and I mean, there would be some roads that probably wouldn't be a priority right away. Mm -hmm. we, we do have a lot of roads, you know, yeah. but yeah. I, I think they started with trying to get a network so that they could do some connecting of trail to trail, and, and so kind of it was a targeted investment to try to get the most kind of use out of it and, and trying to push people to a spot rather than having a shoulder on every road, trying to encourage the connection and, and, a, and real trail route on PEI. Charles on Brighton. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so do you have a, an accessible map of, of the projects you have done and the ones you are planning in the future that, we did. that uh, people that are concerned about these things can, can access? Um, I, have a, I have a few notes on what we've done this year, but I don't have a, an actual map, the map that they're trying to connect. So I have to bring that back, but um, uh, where am I at here? So they had done a chunk of the Pommel Road, um, the PE Home Active Transportation Trail, uh, the Mor Morrell Confederation Trail Bridge, Vernon River Construct Confederation Trail, the Brackley Point Road widening, uh, St. Nicholas Confederation Trail, Montague to Lower Montague Road. Route 13 in Glasgow, Route 20 in Kensington, the Indian River, and then uh, a bunch of smaller projects. Charlotte and Brighton. Oh, I appreciate the, uh, the list as well as the magnitude of those projects, but what I'm looking for, if we don't have it already, are you planning to make a map so somebody who wants to take a bicycle tour can look up and see where it's actually possible to go, just like you can with a the regular roadmap, I think, is available on that. Yeah. On uh, uh, I'm sure that's part of the plan. Uh, if there is one, we'll bring it back or we'll bring you the progress on it. Charlotte and Brighton. Um, I was wondering who actually designs the act of <coughs> transportation paths and uh, what are their qualifications? That's not something that we can answer here on the floor. Um, we can bring it back. Yeah, it will be staff within the department. Um, yeah. So, we can bring back whatever information we can get on that. Charlotte on Brighton. Well, as, as I said before, I'm uh, very pleased with the overall quality and uh, magnitude of the work. But sometimes it seems like uh, it's very engineer-oriented. Uh, the, the engineers, for good reasons, like to put the bicycle right next to the roadway, which is hardly the, most, the best place as far as cyclists is concerned. So. I am uh, I'm kind of looking for somebody in the department uh, trying to steer bicycle paths away from the road wherever possible, for instance, in the, uh, in the bypass around Charlottetown. There's lots of land on both sides. There's no reason to have that active transportation path right next to the, uh, the splat on noise and danger of the traffic, if it's all possible to move further in. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm good. You're very welcome. Shall a section carry? Uh, honorable members, there's been some um, information uh, that was requested, um, some, I guess, response to questions asked previously. I have one, two, three, four, five handouts. Has everyone received five handouts? If you haven't, please let the clerk know. We're moving on to capital improvements, buildings, appropriations provided for the renovation, retrofit, and construction of government buildings and properties. Buildings, $20,455,000. Total capital improvements, buildings, $20,455,000. Shall the section carry? Um, Question from Summerside Wilmot. Just curious if this is the section where biomass falls under? Uh, biomass, yes. It is. I was curious how much we are investing in biomass in this budget. Mm. This particular budget, mm, 960000 
Uh, so yeah, this particular budget is 960000 Summerside Wilma? Thank you, Chair. And how much would that be in the next five years? That's the total. That's the five-year range. It's, it's this year, but there's none going forward in the capital budget. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Can you explain to me why that is part of the plan when we have a goal to get to net zero? Um, this is sort of, um, I guess, a study was done on where biomass was going to be suitable for government-owned buildings, and I think they're coming to the end of where the practical applications could, could go. Um, um, up until now, we have about 44 provincial buildings hooked on for biomass, and um, in the next year, I think the final piece of the puzzle will, will um, add another three provincial buildings to uh, bring us up to 47. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate that, but it really doesn't answer my question. Biomass is not a, a carbon neutral option. It's actually not carbon neutral in a reasonable time frame. It's carbon neutral in the time it takes to grow back a tree, which in some cases is 30 years, in some cases is 70 years, in some cases is, a, is 100 years. It's, it's not a legitimately carbon neutral option, and we're on our path to net zero. I don't understand the significant investment continuing into um, a pathway that we know is still emitting. Uh, well, Honorable Member, Member, I don't have in front of me what the justification or the, the rationalization is from the Department, but we'll be, bring back whatever we can. Summerside Roman. Thank you, Chair. I think it's important to bring back um, information on that because, frankly, a big part of what we're talking about here is trying to get to zero, trying to get to net neutral. And the Minister has talked that the way to get there is electrification. It absolutely is. That would be correct. What, what we need to be doing is switching to electric pathways for heating. This, this just doesn't get us there. So I don't think we can pass this section until we have information on that. Well, what I, what I would add in the interim, so again, this is the tail end of a, the project. Um, these are replacing older oil-fired boilers. What they're suggesting is that um, we will have replaced for almost 5 million litres of, of furnace oil, um, which by burning wood, which is, is better than burning furnace oil. Um, the industry itself and part of the project was not <coughs> to be clear-cutting, but to be responsibly harvesting uh, trees that would be used in this particular um, endeavour. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. And if our goal was a reduction in emissions, then that would be a really great choice. That makes perfect sense to me. Trying to get to our 2030 goal of reducing carbon emissions, that makes loads of sense. But for the mandated legislative targets of getting to net zero by 2040, this makes absolutely no sense. Do we have any idea of the life expectancy on biomass? Um, I can't give you that, Honourable Member, but I can tell you from working uh, and being involved with the Woodlot Owners Association that they are really uh, interested in doing uh, sustainable forestry, and that would be one way of use, utilizing some of, of the trees that are being cut down is for the biomass, and they are fully supportive of it. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I have no doubt that they are, and I think there are absolutely ways you can manage forests sustainably and harvest the wood and use it, but do you have a sense of the percentage of wood that you would need to be getting off of those wood lots versus the need that the investment you are putting in creates because I've done the math on this in the past and I can tell you we don't have enough forests on PEI that we can sustainably harvest from them and feed the biomass investments. So Honorable Member, all I have is the figures in front of me. We'll bring back whatever we can. Then I'll just ask that we not pass this section until we have those numbers. Okay. Thank you. Charles and Brighton. I have, well, I'm actually equally concerned about this uh, biomass heat inst installation. Uh, we sent uh, several M MLAs, including the Minister of Energy, to Denmark a couple of years ago, uh, where they would have learned if they listened that burning wood was definitely out and a bad thing for the environment. In fact, oil pollutes less than wood chips, so uh, it, it's really silly to put a <coughs> high 
high capital cost conversion to wood chips, and when that's precisely the last thing we need, uh, it would be, make far more sense to keep on the old oil burner and uh, carry on with the necessary renovations to the building so they wouldn't need as much heat to begin with. Um, I have uh, so I was one, uh, so the other point is that uh, although they do and can uh, harvest uh, wood chips sustainably on the island, uh, there's only a couple of companies that actually do it. So my bet is, without the information from the department, is that 90% of the chips that's available on the market that I'm sure the woodlot owners would love to sell to the government uh, are probably harvested unsustainably using clear-cutting methods. So my question is to the department, uh, should you not be uh, buying only guaranteed uh, sustainably harvested wood chips from now on to, to meet your goals? Uh, Honorable Member, I, I can't comment on that. I'm here to present the figures for the department, um, and but we will bring back whatever information we can. Sure, okay. Brighton. Thank you. Um, on another list uh, on the handout here, um, I see you have a fairly large amount down for the Georgetown Church uh, Preservation. Uh, um, I was just curious why the government is uh, preserving churches. Um, I, I, it's, it's not going to be used as a church, Honorable Member. It's, uh, it is an historical building in Georgetown, and uh, they're looking at uh, preserving it and exploring uh, different options for actually utilizing it. Okay, so for public use. Okay. Charlton Brighton. And um, there's also a very substantial figure down for the Kings County Highway Depot. Um, is that, um, where is that located and what, what is involved there? Um, it's one of the, uh, the depots that Department of Transportation has for, for snow plows and school, school buses. buses. And uh, there is uh, an upgrade uh, in addition being added to that because it's needed. Shout out Brighton. So is that the one located in uh, Bridgetown? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Shout out Brighton. Okay. Okay. Shall the section carry? Carry. No. Okay. No. Honorable no. members, I'm going to ask uh, for those who are in favor of carrying this section to please, those who are in favor of carrying this section, to please raise your hand. Those not in favor of carrying this section, please raise your hand. Okay, so this section is carried. Total capital expenditure, transportation and infrastructure, <coughs> 72 million six hundred and ninety-five thousand. Shall it carry? Carry. Members, we are going to go back to um, page 19. Uh, capital expenditure for health PEI. The total capital expenditures for health PEI, um, oh, sorry, the capital improvements section on this page was read. It was under discussion. The motion was put forward requesting additional information. It was agreed upon by the uh, members that when the information um, requested, was received that we would we return to discussion on this. So I'm going to ask the members if we are, I guess, satisfied with the information provided and continue to discuss this particular section. So, members, um, shall we go back to this section on capital improvements for health PEI? No. Yes. Okay, I have majority of yes, so we are going to go back to capital improvements. Um, this section has been read and is now open for discussion. <coughs> Pine Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, so since we were last discussing this section, um, we did have a briefing on the medical homes and medical communities, uh, and I know that that information uh, there was information shared publicly as well. 
Um, however, uh, the questions that were particularly pertaining to the capital expenditures that we are currently debating, I have to sadly say that I do not feel that there was any further clarity provided on the 63.6 million that is being allocated for those homes. Now, I wanna just stress something here. Um, the idea of the medical homes and medical communities uh, is not a new idea. This is not an idea of this government. It is has uh, been um, promoted by the College of Family Physicians um, for over a decade. Um, so it's a good, it's, and you know what, it's, there's a lot of merit to the idea of it. I'm not debating the idea. What I am concerned about and what I feel is really our job is to uh, ensure that the implementation of that idea is, is going to go smoothly and is going in, is, is aligned with those, what the plan is for, you know, that uh, best practices have shown have, have been effective in these um, medical homes and medical communities and other jurisdictions. So when I'm asking questions about how the 63 million is going to be spent, my questions are not about the idea of a medical home. My questions are about the concrete spending of this money and how we came to that dollar amount. Now, I understand this is an evolving project. But the concern I have is that the briefing actually made me more confused about where that figure came from. When I asked about, is that 63 million for to you know the five medical homes that are supposed to be the starting point for this project, the answer I got was no, not necessarily. Could be for more than five. We don't really know. And yet the numbers that we were given here were, I think, divided over four of the medical homes for the 63 million. So I have no clarity on how those numbers came to be, how we got to 63 million, and why each community was allocated a certain amount. Um, so that's really the major, that's, that's, that's the crux of this issue here right now, currently, around the capital expenditures. And I have to say that, um, you know, I don't, I still don't know those answers. So can you, can you clarify, like the 63 million, is that just for the five medical homes that are supposed to start this project off? Um, or is it for more than five? Like, what is it for? Um, what I have that was presented and, and contained within the 63 million that you're referring is um, the uh, fit up for Kings County, um, a, re a new build government owned in Summerside, a new build government owned in Charlottetown, a fit up in um, Second in, in I say Charlton, sorry in the Queens Queens area, Queens County, and um, a um, there's a, a building being constructed in uh, West Prince. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Yes. Yeah, so okay. So so yes. Yeah, so that was in in the the information that was provided. But again, I have no further clarity on you know what how those different amounts were chosen. Um, you know how many different healthcare pr practitioners are we expecting to be at each of those locations? Um, you know, how are we going to be um, deciding which types of healthcare prof professionals are needed for each community? Because that's a really important question. You know, we've heard that it's going to be based on needs of a community, um, but I have no idea how you're going to determine that or how you came to these sort of numbers to start with. So, you know, I, I appreciate that you, um, you know, uh, minister and uh, you know that you don't have all the information but for me the the information provided um, from health PEI simply didn't answer the very basic questions about the capital budget I will also want to point out another um, just another question here that you know was not answered clearly um, at the briefing I asked about the wait list and the impact on the the wait list for doctors of this new model that seems like a pretty simple question um, and when I asked that the first response I got back was actually it's not doctor wait list it's the teams and it's a team model okay great fine I get that however we have a wait list right now so how will that wait list be impacted and at, I was told, I don't know, um, it's it's going to have an, some sort of an impact. We don't know. Now, in the media, I'm reading that they're saying apparently uh, the the same team told the media that it would have a 50 percent um, reduction. Uh, the wait list would be reduced by 50 percent. That was told just two hours later. That wasn't told to us. So how did we get to that 50 percent number? Um, Honorable member, I do not have the answer for that. 
Um, I could not attend the briefing at the time, but uh, again, if, if you're not satisfied, I guess we, we can go back to the department and, and see what other information we can get. I mean, we're not talking about operational here at all. We're talking mm -hmm. about bricks and mortar and talking about, uh, you know, having the facilities, the actual, you know, buildings and uh, that we want to, um, the money we want to spend to ensure that we have these medical homes and neighborhoods. Um, up and running and operational the operational budget will deal with the, the staffing and uh, you know any um, operational needs mm -hmm. time Valley Sherbrooke yeah no and I do I understand that this is money you want to spend I get that this is money that you want to spend to get this off the ground but I don't I still just don't have enough information as to how you came to those numbers and it's you know, that information must have been provided. It must, something more than what we've been given about the actual numbers must have been provided to you, and I, I can't be satisfied by what's been provided so far. Um, I would uh, certainly be open to holding this section again if there's more information that can be brought back. But uh, as it stands, the questions just weren't answered. I'm sorry. That's all from, from me. Okay. Thank you. Summerside Winslow. Summerside <laughs> Wilmot. <laughs> was close. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Chair. You can handle it. You can handle it. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So I also had additional questions coming out of that meeting. I found it helpful to get an idea of what the government and minister means when they talk about medical homes and neighborhoods, and it did help us clarify that concept. But it didn't get down into the specifics for the capital budget, as my colleague was highlighting. And my concern for Summerside specifically is a year ago, I had asked the minister to replace the Harborside Health Center. It's a mess. It needs to be replaced. I'm glad that's happening. But if the plan is to replace that and that is the medical home we are getting for Summerside, then all my constituents who are still waiting for a doctor will not be encompassed because they're already at their capacity. I need to know that the only health medical, excuse me, medical home that's gonna be happening in Summerside is actually going to improve the problem for my constituents. And I don't have an answer on that yet. I, I, that again, I can't bring back that information. I do not have it in front of me, honorable member. Uh, we'll bring back what we can. If you're not satisfied with the answer, then we'll bring back what we can. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that because that was a question I had asked previously when we were going through this, and that information did not come back, which is why I was not in favor of going back to this section because we still haven't had our questions answered. Chairs. Okay. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. I This is a huge problem because I've got so many people who are waiting for family doctors, and if this Harborside Clinic replacement is going to happen and is also going to increase capacity, then I would very much be in favor of it. Call but the hour. The hour has been called. Mr. Chair, I know the speaker take the chair and the ch chair report progress in Begley Pacific. Shall I carry? Chair of the Committee of the Hall House have under consideration the grant of capital supply to Her Majesty. Yeah. I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the adoption of the Committee be adopted. I, I, I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Charles Garrett. The Honourable Member from Morrell, Donna and the Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move, second by the member for Tignish, Palmer Road, and the Deputy Speaker, that this House adjourn until Thursday, November 4th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shall I carry? Yes. Yes.